Sorry about being late. Let's do an audio check right here at the bottom of the thread. Let me know how my audio is. Good afternoon, Mr. Brashears. Thank you, Iron Shamrock. Sounds good. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Listen, there, I was under the impression there is a feature that I can slow that chat down for y'all, but it doesn't seem to be anywhere in. I'm sorry. Or there's no, I thought there was a setting that allowed me to do that. Haramal player, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just don't see. I don't see. I'm sorry. I'm not going to waste time. I'm not going to waste you guys' precious time trying to find a setting. I was looking for it too earlier. Hey, Benny. Thank you, Benny. change my camera angle a little bit and uh yeah i endorsed the beverage last time and i'm gonna have to say that I'm, I'm rather addicted to starbucks cold coffees because in texas it's hotter than hellfire and i'm also going to say that i have verified that the sun is white hot and all my life it's been yellow and uh yeah I saw somebody mention that in the comment section. I thought, you know, uh, I, I don't really give much thought to those type of things. It's not anything I can reference in a bibliography, but I have to trust my senses. And yes, and my memory. There's no doubt. The sun was yellow. It's been yellow all my life. Uh, and uh, it's white hot right now. It, I looked up in the sky, burned my eyes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very unusual. The type of heat we're having right now isn't ordinary. Uh I have two shop fans. They blow real hard, and I went through, I went and got them. And my dog house has has front and back doors that open up. I have the fans situated on one side so they'll just blow through there because it's just too hot outside for dogs as well. I'm not gonna lie. If I'm not gonna want to be in the heat, and I don't have fur, I'm sure not gonna make make them stay out there. This Texas heat will kill them. There's no doubt. 
Oh my God. And the ancient Greeks thought they knew what ambrosia was. Wow. All right. Hope you guys like my intro music. I do not have time to sit here and read all these all these comments. We'll get to them. Yeah, Boopster. We're getting to that. As a matter of fact, for so for the for those of you who don't know, we'll look at this real quick. Now, I am I'm very abusive to my own materials. I'm not talking about old books like I have on my show. I have some very old books here, like this was gifted to me recently. It's a Bible from 1893. I have some other books like, oh, uh, this is in a case. It's a history book that was published in 1910. I have many books from 1923, 24, 1925, 1936. I got a lot of those books. but uh, And I've read even more over the years. But this is my own book, Anunnaki Homeworld, that was published in 2011, the research, the research that it has, it's all, I mean, it's a very old, I mean, the book is, is absolutely packed full of illustrations, charts, uh, all kinds of chronographical information. But the main thing it's packed with is uh, sources. Many of these books are very, very difficult to find now. But the sources go on and on, chapter by chapter by chapter. So when I'm discussing things about the Anunnaki, I'm not talking about things in theory. I'm talking about things that can be verified and be shown. Unfortunately, many people think that a YouTube video qualifies as evidence. It's not. It's just a presentation of the data. So this book here went into a lot of depth about the, the Anunnaki. But I didn't go into too much depth about the difference between Anuna and Anunnaki. And there is a big difference. That is revealed in other books. I have, let's see, no book I have published. I never do this. I never just go through my books. I don't think I've ever had a video. In Every once in a while in a video, I will show you guys a book that I've published because I'm referring to a point. And, uh, but you know what? This video here, I don't, I have never really advertised this book. I don't have a single video of all my 300 and something videos about this book, but this book is selling rather nicely on Amazon. Uh, I should, I really should put myself more out there. I just don't. I am not, uh, I don't have people that critique the subject matter because when they open the book and they read it, they're blown away. They, oh my God, we, we've discovered all this and they can't believe the sources. And I mean, the book is huge. This book is big. This is a, this is a thick book. Uh, 400, well, the actual data in, wow, page 414, a Phoenix number, 138 times three. So, uh, but the bibliography too is extensive. This bibliography go, it just goes and goes for days. Yeah, that's a lot of bibliographic material. Pages and pages and pages of source materials. Complete bibliography of cited works. I mean, you guys are listening to somebody who has done a very extensive amount of research. I've actually read these old books. I have read all these old chrono chronographical materials. When I say chronographical, this is something else you need to understand. We have books like, I didn't just do my own chronological studies. I have studied older chronologists from way back in the day who have published their own materials, like Sir Isaac Newton, who was a chronologist. You guys already know, I have this book here. This, this entire book, written over 300 years ago, is nothing but a history of the world year by year, using the Annus Mundi system. Let's see, this book here. Science, uh, science history, the science history of the universe. Yeah, published in 1910. Little bitty book, little bitty book, but you can't judge a book by its cover. Look how much data per page. Absolutely small print, which is the reason why my blind ass has to use this. I got to use this in a lot of my, my, my research because all the old books used very, very small uh, print blocks. This is very, very small print blocks, mm -hmm. and it's some fascinating material. But I don't have time to play with my toys right now. We're doing a presentation. See you guys are at. 
632 people in here, 245 likes. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Okay, let's see here. Check this out. Just to give you an example. Just give you an example. Let's just I just simply just pulled this book off the shelf. Let's look at it for a second. All right. How about this guy is mentioning Jason and the Argonauts on page 17. That's pretty interesting. Here's what he says. A book written in 1910. This is why I like to read books that were published before World War II. But all the publishers before the Nuremberg trials were basically publishing some pretty real stuff. Now, there was some censorship entered after 1902, but it didn't really take off until after 1946. Because for those of you who don't know, the Nuremberg trials changed everything. So the people that took over control of Hollywood and the, uh, the uh, publishing industry since the Nuremberg trials have basically been in control of your education ever since. If you don't go back to books that are pre-World War II, you're getting a pseudo-education. You're getting a YouTube education. And when I say that, I have to even include me. Because if you haven't read, like, I'll get back to this book in a minute. I mean, we're talking about, I don't have just... This is not a YouTube education. This goes to the original source materials. You will read actual translations from texts that are thousands of years old. In this book, Shocking Secrets of Antiquity, I provide it on Amazon. Like I said, I should push it more, but I don't. As a matter of fact, I think it's the first time I've ever, in any video, I've ever held up my own book. So, oh, I just like to put the information out there for people to get. I told you guys, I'm not trying to get rich. I'm trying. I'm trying to distribute materials that I know that the world is starving for. If you, Many of you have read my book, When the Sun Darkens, my very first book on the Phoenix. Little did I know that before this book would even get published by Book Tree Press in San Diego, which is, this too, is packed with charts, diagrams, bibliographic materials, the 138 year, this book proves there's a 138 year Phoenix reset system implemented. What I didn't know when I wrote this book was that while waiting for the publication of this book, I never stopped researching. I found so much new material on the Phoenix from so many more records when I was putting all my, my stuff together. I had to publish another book. I wrote another manuscript, put it all together, had my fact checker go through, go through all my references. Oh, that's one thing you need to know about, about my research. I challenge you to fact check anything I say in my books because if I assert something is a fact in the text, you can guarantee there's a number behind that sentence. And you can go look at that corresponding number in the back of any of my books, and you will find where that fact came from. This is why I, I tell you guys in all my video presentations, I am not worried about anyone. A, a member of the lay, like laity, like me, well, lay public like me, a member of the laity, the clergy, I'm not worried about academia. Anybody wants to critique my theories, that's fine, because you're not challenging me. You are challenging my source materials. That's a distinction. So, this book, tremendous more, amount more data. Now, waiting for the publication of this book, I just couldn't stop. I, I kept researching, kept researching, kept researching. And my second Anunnaki book has 10 times more material than my original one from 2011, uh, Anunnaki Homeworld. This book here um, goes into the pre-flood world, goes, goes into meticulous chronological studies, shows you exactly where our timekeeping systems come from, how they were developed, and how they were all a part of one single unified system that because of a cataclysm, the memory of that system was fragmented and preserved culturally in different ways. But every ancient calendar of the old world stemmed from one timekeeping system. It's all, it's all described in this book. It's all traced. Here's just a little, little idea for you guys that want to know. Here's the uh, title page. I mean, this is what that book, this book contains. Book is, the, book is, the book is in depth. It's not a thick book, but it doesn't need to be because you can pack a tremendous amount of data in 300 pages when the print is that small. 
My publisher does the same thing old old book publisher does. As a matter of fact, he's outfitted that way because Book Tree Press of San Diego publishes reprints. Now, those of you that have emailed me asking me for that catalog, I have all sent that catalog to you, and I extend that. Hey, once a day, I'll sit down and go through my emails, and sometimes I'm just copy and pasting, copy and pasting, copy and pasting. I do that for you because that is my chief goal. I am trying to educate as many people as possible because the more I educate others, the more they educate others, and it takes the weight off of me. I have no problem copying and pasting materials. I give away free materials every day. If you want the book tree catalog and the thousands of titles of old books that are no longer found in the publishing world that book tree press has brought back and started reprinting cheap paperback copies of, that's what my publisher does. He publishes old reprints. His catalog is fantastic. I also include that fat of uh, that, uh, I was about to say fatalog, that catalog in all my, my uh, thumb drives, every thumb drive I sent out. Oh, you know what? That's an announcement I need. Before we get deep off into this Anunnaki stuff, I need to let you guys know, please don't order thumb drives from me anymore unless you're ordering the Super Pack. No more Phoenix thumb drives. No more Anunophile thumb drives. In, in the comment section and in the description of this video, when we're done, I'm going to include those links. But you can now download in one single, one single download, you can download all 41 Phoenix videos onto your device, all in the exact order that you need to watch them. Also, last night I uploaded 40, the 46 videos of the of the Anuna files, the entire Anunnaki history, all my videos, and even videos that weren't in there but needed to be. I put them all in there, and they're not in the order YouTube has them. I put them in the in the on Podia in the order that you need to watch them. So those are two downloads now now available. It's a uh, uh, they're on Podia if you want to check out those links. As far as thumb drives go, I will continue to mail thumb drives out. I'm not mailing Phoenix and Anunnaki thumb drives out anymore. It's too taxing. I don't like going to the post office doing all that. But I will continue to do that for those who want this. If you want this, this is different. This is the super pack. I will have the link for that too. This is the only thumb drive I'm going to mail out for now. It's almost 2,000 pages of posts articles, images, hundred, throw over 360 charts, diagrams, timelines, bibliographies of old books you've probably never heard. All my source materials for, for my Phoenix thesis, my Anuna, my Anuna Files thesis, my Great Pyramid thesis, all the articles that I have ever posted in the hundreds on Facebook. You don't have to go through Facebook no more. Everything that I have ever written, all my unpublished books, all my published books, all my all of Chronicon, everything is in the super pack. And you'll be surprised. Super cheap. I'm not I'm talking about a lifetime worth of research, something that will keep you reading for months. All my unpublished notes. Remember, I told you guys I had I had almost 1,500 pages of notes I was scanning, handwritten notes, material, and data that I have never released on YouTube. I have never even put in published books. Just haven't had time. I need to just distribute this material so I can relax and just upload videos like twice a week on YouTube that'll just videos that'll blow your mind, but there's no longer an urgency to get my material out there because now it's spread out and I don't have to worry about if anything ever happens to me or other people that are researching the things because there are several people who are following in my footsteps. I have a lot of people now that I confer with that are following up and finding their own things about the Phoenix I didn't know about, about 1902, about the Anunnaki histories. People are telling me things about the Great pyramid I did not know. Now, that is the only thumb drive I'm providing now, and it's straight. It's just pure. It's just pure data sets, bibliographic materials, actual book cover images of all the hundreds of books I, I have read. That a lot of them that are out of print that you need to know. You need to be aware of to educate yourself. So anyway, having said all that, I got that out of the way. That's been that's been really an impediment to me. Especially the international mailing has stopped me from get, from getting doing things I need to do. So anyway. This book, this book here, every book that I have right here I'm talking is going to be linked below. I'll do that. I don't do that often. Like I said, I don't push my books. Uh, I got people telling me that I really should. My publisher's been been trying to push me to do it forever, but I'm not, I'm, I'm never going to allow myself to come across as someone who's just trying to try, who is in it for the money because 
For two and a half years, I was uploading YouTube videos with nothing in return. All I was doing was preparing all my playlists, everything on the dark scriptures, everything you need to know about the truth of the biblical materials and the extra canonical materials and why they were removed. That's in the dark, dark scriptures playlist. My, my Lost Secrets of Giza about the Great Pyramid, which is also Anunnaki related, it had to be a separate series of videos to get people to understand how it relates to the other data sets, like the Phoenix playlist. The Phoenix playlist and the Great Pyramid playlist go in tandem, but I, I could never release them together because you would mix the information in your mind. You have to understand these are independent data sets that just correlate perfectly. So then there's the Anuna files, which, which puts back the history of the world in the proper context because Zechariah Sitchin lied and he, he really effed up a lot of people into believing. People like, I'm going to tell you something, people like Billy Carson. A lot of y'all respect Billy Carson. And as a personal, on the personal level, he may be a great guy. Drink a beer and barbecue with him. I don't know. But on a professional level, Billy Carson got to where he is today by creating and moderating about 12, 12 to 15 different Facebook groups. And in those Facebook groups, he pushed Zechariah Sitchin. And in the in, as he pushed Zechariah Sitchin, he was teaching people that the Sumerian records revealed that kings for, I mean, Kings in ancient times lived 40,000 years that the Sumerian records show us of these long longevities that all the Atlantis was 13,000 to 10,000 BC. All this is easily disproven and it's easily disproven without even looking at anything modern. We can go by just the ancient authors that these modern authors totally ignore like Eudoxus who, who told the truth about the old Egyptian dating systems told the truth that the Egyptians, every time they gave out these long dates, they were precisely accurate, but they added, they added a zero. They added a zero where none belong. And they used lunar reckoning instead of lunar solar or solar reckoning. The Greeks recorded everything in solar reckoning. So they took the old lunar numbers of the Egyptians, applied them to the Greek frame of reference on their calendars, and they came up with 9,000 years before Solon that, that there was this great war with Atlantis and the Greeks. When there was no Egypt, there was no Atlantis, and there was no Greeks. It's too early in history. But if you go by the dating methods that were applied in ancient Egypt, according to Eudoxus and Diodorus Siculus and Strabo, everything makes sense because everything is divided by 12 and 13. That's where it gets tricky, though, which one to use as a divisor. But either one, it doesn't matter because you're dividing by the months of the year. And when you do that, it brings the Atlantis cataclysm to the 14th century BC. When we do have a major Phoenix cataclysm and we have destruction recorded all through all throughout the Middle East and the Mediterranean and Egypt. We have records of that destruction that comports with the, the, the sinking of Atlantis. It comports with the great war of the proto-Greeks, the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, and, and, the, and the people of Argos, the ancient Achaeans. There, they did have a war against, against uh, another people. Uh, it brings into context the Sea Peoples Confederation and the invasion of the Sea Peoples. Everything comes into context when you use the proper dating methods, not not the hyperbole. So, so I've, I, I'm reason I'm mentioning this is because about five of you in the comments in the last seven days have mentioned Billy Carson, and I just wanted to put this video out. Please stop. I'm not interested in Billy Carson. I cannot take anyone seriously who would ever teach another person to believe that someone could live for 48,000 years and that the historical record conveys this. It's not. It's a mathematical discrepancy. If you can suspend your disbelief to believe that someone can live that long, you can be made to believe in anything. And I don't need you as a student of archaics. I don't need that character type in this chat or watching my videos who is susceptible to believing anything like that because history makes sense. It's very logical. It's a mathematical framework that I've shown. You guys have seen it. I've shown you all over time. Here is the history of the world laid out as a mathematical structure. It's called Chronicon. And nothing, 
that Zechariah Sitchin says about the ancient world when interpreting it his way that shars were years makes sense, especially when a hundred years ago Sumerian scholars during the days of Samuel Noah Kramer were publishing historical translations and reports showing that the word shar was a unit of measurement and that sometimes on ships manifest in Akkadian and Sumerian tablets recorded the weight of their of their merchandise in shars. That means shar does not mean year. Zechariah Sitchin lied. And I can't say he was mistaken because he's read the same books and the same reports I have. So he was well aware of the controversy. The deal is, is Sitchin was supported by a very wealthy benefactor who allowed Sitchin to become very, very popular in his theory by giving him the necessary funding. So I don't have that type of funding. And there's a reason for that. I'm not pushing that agenda that everything was hundreds of thousands of years old, which would comport with the Freemason, the Freemason construct that we know of as history as the uniformitarian view, the this great elaborate hundreds of thousands of years of human development, it did not happen. As I have shown you many times in my presentations, as with the appearance of the Anuna, every race in this world suddenly appeared. They appeared perfectly intact with an infrastructure, with, with memories already implanted in them. There was no slow development. I tell you guys all the time, our world is not what you think, and our history isn't what you think. And men like Billy Carson and others that push anything that is Sitchin related are not anyone that I am interested in doing a podcast with. I'm not interested in their opinions. I'm not interested in any dialogue with them whatsoever. I am only interested in putting out the truth, and the truth is easily verifiable. I have bibliographies that would astonish you. All you got to do is pick them up. So that's Anunnaki Homeworld. We're going to talk about that today. Here's my book, uh, Giants on Ancient Earth. This book's pretty big. I don't know. I don't even know how many pages. It don't even matter. It's a small print. Again, again, the bibliography. Yeah, the bibliography goes on for days. It's huge. I don't even know how many books I cited in this uh, in this book, but all of this is bibliography. All of this is source materials. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fairly big book. I don't claim to be a best-selling author. I never have been. As a matter of fact, a lot of people are turned off by my material for the simple fact is that it's so meticulous that I get absorbed in the data and just re revealing the data that I lose the narrative of lot. I'm trying to teach people what the truth is about history. I really don't care about putting it into a cohesive structure, like a story that's easily to absorb. observe that, that, I mean, I, I will admit all my books could be rewritten much better for, for better absorption. Although some people give me five stars and say it's the best books they ever read. But a lot of people are turned off by my presentation because I'm not out to write a Graham Hancock type book. Authors like Graham Hancock, Robert Bovell, Robert Schock, these men, these men are fantastic as far as their ability to put out material that the, that the uh, publishing houses like and can push and put out. I, re I regard those men as putting out pure entertainment. I do not, they are not educating the people. They are miseducating the people. And uh, I have, I have, I have fingerprints of the gods right here. As a matter of fact, what a comment a while back really ticked me off. And I was about to do something, do something that was going to take me about three weeks. And then I decided not to, I was about to write about a 70 page, uh, basically an assault against fingerprints of the gods, itemizing every untrue fact in that book that I've marked with a pencil and showing you actual books from the old world that correct that information that Graham Hancock should have known. I was going to do that, but I let my emotions get the best of me and it took me off track. I am not about attacking anybody. I'm not attacking Bill, uh, Billy Carson. I'm not attacking. I am about telling you my opinions about people when I, when I, when I, when I find out what their research or their core their core findings are what they're putting out to the people. I do that. I do, I do, I do a lot. I'm very opinionated because I have strong opinions. I know that these people have, have had access to a lot of the data I have. So for them to put out the material they're putting out is true deception. And there's a reason for that. 
because if you were putting out books like I do, like Lost Scriptures of Giza, the true history, actual records from the old world about the Great Pyramid, what the Great Pyramid's function is, where the Great Pyramid appears in all these ancient holy writings, which you can't find in any books today. That's why this book is so unique. I started a reading of it. As a matter of fact, I'm only this far. That whole two and a half hour video that I released yesterday or the day before yesterday is only this much. I still got like two more videos left uh, to finish this. But this book too, very small print and it's packed. And my, this is my very first published book from 2006. It, it too has a massive, for a book this size, that's a massive bibliography. All of these are books. Title of the book, the year it was published, the author of the book, and who the publisher is. All this. So, anyway, I'm done with that. The reason I, I the reason I, I thought this little diatribe was necessary was because there's so many new people to my channel that they're getting triggered when they come in when they when they watch one or two of my latest podcasts, not realizing that you're listening to a conversation, a podcast. This isn't a data dump. Live videos and podcasts can never cover the amount of information that Archaics brings to the table. Hell, it took me 250 videos before I ever even, even did my first podcast. And that was because the amount of information is so much. And it's so much for people to take in. You have, you have to basically re-educate yourself. You have to, you, you have to go through materials that you're, it's, it's an unlearning process because mo, most of the material that you've learned about ancient comparative religion and stuff, it's half truths or outright lies. So in correcting that information, I had to be very, very meticulous in my first 250 videos. I had to show things that are inexplicable outside the context of a mathematical construct. Things that happen that we have recorded that don't make sense outside of the fact that we are jacked into an unreal reality through a central nervous system that's filtering out so much information. What little it allows us to, to see and perceive is almost all coding. So... I get a lot of new people on my channel that first apologize. Hey, man, I'm sorry. I'm new to your channel, but, and then they go to ask me a question that's been answered 68 times. So I don't want to drive anybody away, but if you see that I'm being less frequent in my answers in the comments section, there's a reason for that. It's, I can't sit here and answer the same questions over and over and over. That's what the first 250 videos are about. I understand if you don't have time in your life to listen to those 250 videos, I get that because I don't have time to listen to the one or two videos 40 to 50 people a week send me to tell, ask me to listen to. I don't have that time. Not if I'm going to continue to put out original material. I cannot contaminate my original research with other people's findings. I can't do that. I can't do that. Archaics from the beginning I have boasted and I will continue this practice. But from my very first videos, I've told you guys, the archaics data will not take a single fact from an internet source. I will stand by that. Everything is from original books and reports. And most of it is, is, is mathematically analyzed. And I've shown you the procedure on how to do that in many, many, many videos. So uh, return to the following ones. Whatever we don't cover in the Anunnaki today or, or in my Nunafiles videos, believe me, this this I could do probably 20 videos out, out of the data that's in this book. But uh, we could do that sometime. Shocking Secrets of Antiquity. And let's get back to this little gem from 1910. What's this guy saying here? He says, uh, on page 17, the first maritime adventure among the Greeks, which lays any claim to authenticity, and the most celebrated in ancient times is the expedition of the Argonauts to Colchis. The date of the expedition may be safely fixed at the year 1250 BC. That's why I love these old books. 1250 BC is almost precisely where I dated it, and I use sources that are not even mentioned in this book. The fall of Troy happened after 10 years. It was 1229 BC, and I have shown this in videos and in published books how we can exactly date the fall of Troy at 1229 BC and not the false Paris columns that dated at 1184 and why they dated at 1184 and why it's wrong. Other researchers have come to the same conclusion, like Frank Joseph, 1229 BC. 
and fascinating historical books too, especially about the Sea People's Confederation. But Jason and the Argonauts is based off a real historical event. That real historical event was a naval was a naval expedition that happened that happened roughly a generation before the Trojan War. But the Trojan War was 10 years long. And it was a Mediterranean war. It was an international war involving, it was actually it was a trade war, but it involved all the nations of the Mediterranean. It lasted 10 years. That, that means it began in 1239. He dates Jason and the Argonox expedition as 1250. And we know from the historical record that men who were alive as boys, we had historical uh, text about this. Men who were boys when Jason took off as an Argonaut were fighting in the Trojan War as men. They were boys when, when Jason took off. So we know it's a generation that separates them. Therefore, here's a book in 1910 that gives all kinds of historical dates and it's dead on the money. I love it. Look at this. This is going to trigger some of y'all. I'm sorry, but look at this. <laughs> Page 21 goes into great detail about how the people of ancient Argos, Mycenae, the Achaeans, pre-Dorian, pre-Dorian invasion Greeks, ancient concept of the world, what they truly believed the world looked like. Do you see that, my friends? I love old books. Absolutely love old books. I could go through my library all day and just show you things I've bookmarked that are absolutely interesting, but we're not going to do that. So, make sure make sure I'm still got good audio going. I see this thread's going off. I see a couple of y'all donate. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It goes by so fast while I'm talking. I'm running my mouth. I can't really say anything. Thank you, though. Let's see. I do read the chat. As soon as my lives are, video, are over, I always go make me a pot of coffee and come in here and I read the chat and I see basically what the temperament of the group is and it also tells me what I need to address next time. So, yeah. That's awesome. That's good. Audio's good. Audio's good. Let's see. All right. So, in all caps... We're going to leave this. I'm going to let you guys dictate what you learned today about the Anunnaki. Let's get this video started. I'm done with my rant. So you guys can right now, starting now, ask in all capital letters what your questions are. I'm not going to dictate what you learn or what I reveal to you. I'm going to allow you to ask the questions you're curious about, and we're going to go from there. So go ahead and hit me with it while I drink this Starbucks. All capital letters, please. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. Well, I asked for I asked for it, didn't I? Hello from Houston, Texas, Fraggle Rock. Wow. Justin Campbell, you say Egyptian calendar has 13 months with a, with, with a question mark. Here's the problem with that. Never in the history of Egypt until he, Egypt was occupied by the Persians has there ever been a unified timekeeping system in Egypt. You can take that to the bank. The problem is, the problem is, is competing priesthoods. The temples at Waset, Karnak, Luxor, Luxor, uh, Thebes, they were always in competition in different, different, different priests adopted different calendars. We look way back into the Bronze Age. We do find that a certain goddess calendar, I think a sexumet, a certain goddess calendar counted Phoenix palms 
And this one was in northern Egypt, which we call lower Egypt, very close to the Great Pyramid. The counting of phoenix palms was how they reckoned the years. And this is interesting because that cult or that, that temple at Heliopolis was the one that housed what's called the Ben Ben Stone, which was supposed to have fallen out of heaven in ancient times, which isn't true. It's actually a prophetic reference to the, the coming of the chief cornerstone in the future. It's just the opposite. The Ben Ben Stone was holy to, the, to, the, to this priesthood at Heliopolis, which was anciently called On, O-N. Before the Greeks called it Heliopolis, very they could see the Great Pyramid from the temple. Now, additionally, in Sumerian times, that site was considered holy, and it was called Anu, which was capital A, capital N, dot, capital N, U. So Anu, not Anu, as in the god, the head of one of the holy trilogy in the Sumerian triad, uh, which later in the Greeks was Uranus the ancient Sumerian Anu. This is Anu, the uh, the city, which the Egyptians call On. It's called the Mansion of the Phoenix. That's where they housed the Ben Ben Stone. It was there that they counted what were called Phoenix Palms. And you can Google Phoenix Palms. Phoenix Palms is a type of palm tree. No one really knows why it's called Phoenix Palms. But its fronds were used to count the years. Uh, in these old traditions, we find references to uh, flooding that occurs uh, in units of 1,656. And I have cited this in my book. Oh, I'm not going to pull them back out. When the sun darkens that I showed you earlier, there are references in ancient, ancient Egypt to a flooding period that occurs uh, every 1656 units. They don't know what really what it means, but we know those of us who are chronologists and those of you who have been following me for a while, you already know what the reference to 1656 is. It's 138 times 12. It is the duration of the vapor canopy before the vapor canopy collapsed into what we call the Great Flood or the day the sky fell, the beginning of the sun calendars. So uh, this is ancient Egypt. There has never been a unified Egyptian calendar until the invasion of the Persians. Basically, an Indo-Aryan people had come into Egypt and they had codified everything. And uh, since the invasion of the Persians, Egypt has never been free. Egypt has always been under somebody else. The Babylonians, the Ptolemies, the, you know, the Macedonians, uh, the Assyrians for a very short period of time. Um, the Persians and the Medes. Oh, then, then, uh, Oh yeah, then the then the uh, Saracens, the Mamluks. You you've heard of the Mamluk histories, the uh, the basically Islamic before before it was Islam, it was Saracen, uh, Nabatean, Sabean. Uh, Egypt's just been overrun by by Arab Arabic peoples. It wasn't they, it wasn't founded by Arabic peoples, but it's been overrun that way. So hold on, it's hot outside. I got two ACs in this building, and a chiller, but I don't have any in the studio. But it's okay. I'm shooting for three hours, guys. You guys can think. You think you can hang with me for three hours? We're only 43 minutes in. All right. Anyway, that was the first question I saw. So, yes, some of those priesthoods maintained a 13-month zodiac. Dendera did, did, did not. The zodiac at Dendera was 12 months. and But you, you really can't go by that. We can go by Eudoxus, though. If the Egyptians put out a number like like a certain war happened 14,700 units ago, you know damn well it wasn't 14,700 years ago because there was no Egypt there. Don't believe, don't believe that Graham history, ver Graham Hancock version of history, Zechariah Sitchin version of history. It's not true. Archaeologists will tell you there is no evidence of any infrastructure of human development, infrastructure being plumbing, cities laid out, urban planning, nothing prior to the 35th century BC. But that's where the mystery happens. We've got nothing before then except a group of people who were wandering away from the caves that they had hid in. A group, a group of people before the 35th century BC who had lost everything. A group of people that anthropologists are calling Caucasoid. A group of people that had button-down jeans. They had button-down pants. 
Females had tassels. They had flowery dresses. They had beads. They wore beads and ribbons in their hair. These people, the men, were fully developed with short arms, large craniums, and on average, they were six foot five to six foot eight foot tall. It's amazing that their women were fully developed at five foot and five foot five foot one on average. These people have been found all around the Mediterranean, and they were centrally located near large cave systems. What had happened was a cataclysm of epic proportions had destroyed a world that had become advanced. These were the survivors. This is why their paintings are so modern. They're so realistic. They drew anatomically correct uh, flora and fauna, animal and plant kingdom, all over their caves. We call these people Cro-Magnon. Whatever happened to them was so devastating we see the evidence of their ancient technology and the fact that their textiles were fantastic, yet they're now being found in cave systems where there are no looms, where there are no textile industries. So we know, we know the Cro-Magnon people as revealed in, 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 many, in many books by like Lewis Spence, uh, somebody who is particularly hated by academia and yet his research is so good, Ignatius Donnelly. Yeah, a lot of people don't like, see, we're going into researchers who are not well liked, like Thor Heyerdahl, because today, any discussion of race is politically, is politically uh, toxic. I've never really give a damn. In my Anuna files, I go straight to the point and tell you about races. And yes, I've had people triggered and I've had to block them from the channel because they can't, they can't deal with it. They can't deal with the fact that all their lives, they've been told this, 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 and this, and they believe it's true. And they see pictures on the internet that show them this, 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 and this. So they think, oh, okay, well, all this is true. Then that just means that the, 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 the history of my people was stolen. That's the problem with getting a YouTube, a YouTube education. Getting a YouTube education is, is a visual education. You're going to believe a lot of the things that you, that you are presented. Because without other frames of reference, which have been censored away, you won't never come across the truth. This is why I put the Anuna files out there. The Anuna files is going to tell you the truth, even though people also often brand me something that I'm not. And I'm okay with that. I don't care. I'm a convicted felon. Hell, I've already told you guys I've committed every single felony except murder. I don't have a, I don't have a, a history to be proud of. It haunts me until this day. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's just the way it is. So I have no other agenda but putting out the information until the day I die, whenever that happens. But I have the information. I've got a tremendous amount of it. Unfortunately, the modern world has been brainwashed into believing historical narratives that are not true absolutely untrue and there's a reason for this the people that own the publishing industry today do have an agenda they have an agenda and have had one for a very long time the very fact that epic research that is verifiable that is so awesome from lewis spence and samuel well not not so much samuel noah kramer but some of his but ignatius donnelly uh professor waddell Thor Heyerdahl, the very fact that you guys don't know these men's research and it's not taught in colleges today should tell you something. Apply the exact same logic that you apply to ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, BBC, all these mainstream news networks. Apply the same logic. Don't, don't, don't change your, don't change your interpretation of the acquisition of information simply because we're talking about two different time periods, apply the same logic. If ABC, NBC, CBS, and all the mainstream media outlets are telling you one thing, and yet we've all been proving the opposite is almost always true, then if the mainstream academia is basically shadow banning Thor Heyerdahl, you need to find out why. If, it, if there's so many people who won't attack uh, Ignatius Donnelly's conclusions in his research, but they will attack him personally, you need to understand why. The history of the Anunnaki answers all of these questions. 
Everything about the Anuna history is so easily comprehended when you shift your frames of reference from anything the establishment today is trying to perpetuate. Because it's all BS. Every bit of it. The people I'm talking about are Cro-Magnon. They had a beautiful infrastructure. Oh, we've seen the evidence of it. Their tools were manufactured uh, beautifully. They were very artistic. The, ana the anatomy of Cro-Magnons is of a sedentary race, not a cave dweller. Troglodytes are like Neanderthals. Those were cave dwellers. Those had, those, they had massively long arms, long finger fingers, almost ape-like. But you know what? Cro-Magnon wasn't. Cro-Magnon was just the opposite. Very tall anatomies with short arms shows a technologically advanced race. And they had been technologically advanced for a very long period of time. And so they developed that way. Giant men with petite females is the anatomical evidence of a sedentary race. Not a race that goes outside and has to work for their food and hunt for a living. No, it's one that has urban planning and development, long leisure, the ability to sit at their tablets and computers and do all kinds of stuff. And this is where we get the Sumerian maze from. Those bags that hold those tablets, the Sumerian maze, tablets of destinies, that, it's the same thing we have today. It's no different, no different than this old Android tablet. What you see in the Sumerian records is when primitive Sumerians were watching the Anuna hold up a tablet and they were doing things on it and they thought they were gods because phenomena would move, machines would do things, things would happen in their environment. They could communicate over vast differences. Yeah, when Aristago went to the underworld, she was in communication with people on the surface. How? They had tablets. They had technology. This is what is inferred. This is why the Sumerian records, which is a cult, it's basically a cargo cult phenomenon. And I have discovered, I have discuss, discussed cargo cult phenomenon many times in my presentations. So for those of you who don't know, cargo cult phenomenon was coined in, after World War II when it was noticed that primitives were mimicking everything that they saw that the United, that the U.S. Marines had done when they had taken over different islands in the Pacific in the Japanese, in the war against the Japanese. So, the, uh, because, because the, they had seen this so many times, they saw that when a man waved sticks on a long strip, like a runway, a, a metal bird would come from the sky and give them giant boxes. And in those giant boxes were the, were those smoke things and that good jerky and all in these drinks that were delicious and these packs that you could add water to, you could boil water, add water to it, mix it up. And it's a meal. And the natives would trade. They would make things out of, out of plants and they would find beautiful seashells and they would bring them to the soldiers and the soldiers would give them cigarettes and the soldiers would give them t-shirts and give them pocket knives and to the natives, they saw that certain activities resulted in certain effects. So when the Marine Corps left the islands after World War II was over, the natives built mock runways, mock buildings, conning tower, you know, control towers. They made sticks. They had shamans go out there and, and wave, and they would pray for the metal birds to come from the sky. This is cargo cult phenomenon, and it's exactly what we read in the Akkadian and Sumerian texts. It's no different. We are reading from the perspective of more primitive people who are trying to keep pace and describe things that are far more sophisticated than they can, they can really compute. This is why we have had so much, so many problems processing what we're finding in the oldest records in the world. Some of these massively massively sophisticated Vedic texts are not like anything that you know of today. I can't remember. I, I have them cited in my published books. I can't pronounce them. Shamanastra. We're talking about aviation texts. We're talking about flight manuals. I am not making anything up. I cite the sources, researchers who've, who've reviewed these texts, where these texts can be found today. They are in China. They're in India. These texts have been found. 4,000-year-old Sanskrit texts that are flight manuals, 101 
pre-flight checks, how to build your Vimina, how to do certain maneuvers, even instructions on how to do Vimina to Vimina aerial battle, like dog fighting. Yeah, we're talking we're talking about we're talking about texts that are revealing uh, revealing to us today that the world that we thought was unique and technologically advanced, we're far behind. Because the propulsion systems they had back then aren't like the ones we have today, and they can't be. This is another message that this is another tenet of the archaics research that people have to wrap their their mind around. We cannot readily imagine how sophisticated the ancient world really was until we wrap our minds around the fact that they lived in a totally different biosphere which required very different technology. The vapor canopy world is not like a world that we know. We have only seen evidence of it in, in man-made small containment fields and biospheres like at Glen Rose, Texas, the one that creation scientists built. The vapor canopy world was dark violet, dark purple sky. The atmospheric pressure was intense. It wasn't like today. One, one breath of air and you could do about four minutes of solid work without having to breathe anymore. Men and women could hold their breath and go deeper because of the atmospheric pressure. They could go far deeper under the water than we can today. We can't deal with that pressure. They lived in it. So and remember, I tell you guys a lot. The human genome is fantastic. And long before this simulacrum began, DNA was already fantastically ancient. This is not our first rodeo. These, these life sims we're experiencing now, they're just one link in the chain of many in the development of our divine personalities. The Anuna, I'm going to tell you now in one sentence that sums up the entire Anunnaki history. But we're going to continue on and answer the questions. The problem with understanding who the Anuna is, is that we try to compartmentalize that data and think that they are someone separate from ourselves, and they are not. We are Anuna, and I have said this in multiple videos. We are the blood descendants of the very race that came here and then intermarried among everyone that was already here. There is no distinction anymore. We are, it's been thousands of years. If there's any true, pure blood Anuna in this world, they are not on the surface. So, and that's another reason why the Anuna had to do what they do. The war for the daughters of men in Genesis 6. It's not what you think. The Jewish version would have you believe that it gave birth to mutants and demons and, and all that. It's not true. It's not true. The intermixture of the Anuna blood and the blood of the indigenous peoples that were already here gave rise to a race that was hyper-intelligent, taller. They were considered as demigods. In ancient Egypt, they were called the Shimsu Hor. They were called the Shining Ones. These were the demigods, the silver race. These people were basically the hybrids between the Anuna and the indigenous people in this world today. The indigenous people were here way before Caucasians ever showed up. Now listen, don't let your frames of reference trigger you. We don't have a universally accepted way to say white people because some people get offended by the term white people. They want you to say Europeans, Europoids, Caucasoids, Cauc Caucasians. Caucasian is a geogra geographical designation that's understood by all. All I am saying is basically I'm talking about white people. That's what was born into the world. Did Jason make this up? Hell no. Do we have historical records that claim that this alien angelic type race showed up and they knew all the sciences, knew all the knowledges, they knew all the philosophies, they knew all the astronomy, they, they, had, they had all the education, they were willing to teach the people, but all of a sudden, after they were here for a little while, all of a sudden, 
normal indigenous people began having white babies. This is the story of Noah's birth. I didn't make this up. I cite the records, and I am not the only author who has developed this conclusion. Thor Heyerdahl spent his life recording this exact same history. He didn't. He, he's, he's, Thor Heyerdahl is, is in a league of his own. I've read all his books. Now, all throughout the world, the indigenous peoples have traditions of the appearance of white people. They came last. They came late. My own personal theory is that whoever the pure blood Anuna are, they can't live on the surface. For whatever reason, they die quick. This is why we have the elements. The elements are hidden in the Eden story of Adam and Eve, the serpent, the two trees. Because Eden means walled enclosure. It is a place of protection. Adam and Eve were subservient to whoever the gods were. Because remember, it's the Judeo-Christian version of the story that gets you to think of gods in the singular. But the text is plural. It says the gods made man after their own image. Therefore, humans, all the indigenous humans that were already in the world, were made in the image of their creator. Their creator had two eyes, a nose, mouth, looked, was human, basically the same thing. But for some reason, the creator couldn't live on the surface. So they, they stayed in these Edens. They tried to convince the indigenous people, the Adamu, they tried to convince them. You understand, I'm not making Adamu up. Those of you who have not been following my research, I'm going to tell you real quick. Hundreds of references to a race of people called the Adamu are found in Akkadian and Babylonian Near Eastern records. I didn't make that up. There are many authors who were before I was ever born in 1973 were already publishing this. The Adamu is a race, is a reference to a race of people before the flood. Now, these people, the Adamu, they uh they had freedom to be able to move around and go everywhere, but they were imprisoned in the mind. Meaning, the gods had basically told them they couldn't do this and they couldn't do that or they would die. This is the story of Genesis 1. But it wasn't true. They found out it wasn't true by a benefactor who had told them a little bit more information who didn't like the original plan. This benefactor was later demonized into being a serpent. But the benefactor used that serpent as a badge and became and basically created the serpent people or the people of the serpent who go all throughout history. The people of the serpent aren't what you think they are. Every time they show up in history, they're benefactors. They lay out infrastructures. They create all kinds of, of uh, habitations. They are basically... The, the offshoot race of the trickster. And the trickster is a benefactor who benefited ancient men because the gods that had created the Adamu were liars. They had told them that they would die to instill fear. But when the truth came out, all they could do was curse. What happened in Genesis? Think about it. What happened in, in Genesis when it was found out that Adam and Eve sinned, which is an oversimplification for the Adamu, and the god and the goddess worshippers. What happened? Because remember, Eve was mother of all living, and you have to understand under the vapor canopy, the only thing existing back then were goddess religions. The patriarchy had not even showed up because it wasn't from the surface world. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, which was an oversimplification, the gods didn't kill Adam and Eve. They didn't come out and whip Adam or, or, or enslave Eve. They didn't do any corporal punishments. They didn't do anything because they couldn't. Why? Because Adam and Eve escaped the walled enclosure. They escaped the colony. They got out and realized there's a wide world out here, but now we got to fend for ourselves. We got to eat. We got to defend ourselves. And... It was, it was noticed real quick that there are other, other people out here, and they're of a different, different race completely. This is the story of Cain and Abel and the land of Nod, and that there were others out there that Cain required a mark so he could be protected. Shouldn't be that way. If this is a true creation event, they should be the only people in the world, but it's not. 
because what had happened was a renovation. Genesis 1 is the greatest reset the world has ever experienced. And I have a whole video about that. Matter of fact, I got several videos about the Genesis 1 reset. It's not a creation story at all. It's mimicking the Babylonian Enema Elish, which is a reset story. A civilization that had been all over the world that is totally obliterated. So much that they believed the destruction was so vast, they believed it was a new heavens and a new earth. Year one of the Annus Mundi calendar, year one of the pre-flood world was when this was what this event started. But those inside the Eden, the Anunnaki, the Anuna, they couldn't come out. This tells you that there's a reason they cannot come out onto the surface. There must be a biological reason why. This is the reason why they have released so many different races into the world. So many different attempts to find the right avatar that they are biologically compatible with so that they can move out onto the surface. And they have. They have. There are different blood types that show evidence of, of these excursions. So we have the situation with mankind, the Adamu, rebelling against the gods. They escaped the Eden, which is a walled enclosure. And when they escaped, they didn't get hunted because they couldn't. Because who was that? whoever was hiding in the walled enclosures in the underworld cities, they're unable to come to the surface. Now, I have various theories. This, this, is, this is in the realm of conjecture, but I have various theories that from the beginning, we have two factions at war and that humanity was never, never at fault of anything. The fall of man has nothing to do with humanity sinning and rebelling. The fall of man has everything to do with where the Cro-Magnon came from these beautiful paintings and artwork and all this, all these things we find in the historical record. Let me do another audio check. I'm, I'm going through here real quick. It looked like my chat froze for a second. Audio check. Audio check. Cool. Audio good. Thank you. That's all I needed. One person. That's all I needed was one person to say something. A hundred dollars. Wow. Listen, man, you guys don't have to do that, but you also know that I'm going to put it to use. I, I thank you. I mean that as humbly as possible. I do. Thank you. I need to get back to these questions. So listen, don't think you, don't think you have to use this video as a way to cram an education in. You don't. This is what my Anuna files are about. Everything I'm describing with you, with the sources, the actual text you can go read, these is what I'm telling you, how this construct of history I've put together is the accurate one. It's the only one that makes sense. It's also the only one that uh, it's the only one that pans out with chronology. What you guys what you guys have to consider is that it has always been a mystery to anthropologists that it seems like our modern world, the world of urban planning and development, sewers, canal works, literature, uh, like the advent of, of writing, communication, phonetics, religious systems, priesthoods, government, maritime uh, 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 exploration and trade, the domestication of animals, the domestication and breeding of different dogs. Did you guys know that it is commonly known in, in anthropology that all of this began in the 35th century B.C.? And in the 36th century BC, there's not a trace of it. What? Are you guys processing what I'm trying to tell you now? Many of you, many of you have followed my, my research. And you know what happened at that time. 34, 39 BC, the Nemesis X object appeared. I have told you guys many times, the Nemesis X object is not an intruder planet. It's a super construction and it is inhabited. It appeared in 34, 39 BC. And in the Sumerian records, we find that 432,000 turnings of the stars, Shar, Enki uh, appeared before the flood. 
The Sumerian records are precise. I didn't make that up. You can probably read that in a hundred different published books today. Now, Zechariah Sitchin is going to tell you that that's 432,000 days. So on Facebook, I published a chart which shows you the whole history of the known world and all the thousands of history books that we have that, that fit in this little be span like this. And then all of a sudden, way back here, about 18 feet that way, is 42,000, is, is 432,000 BC. Absolutely ridiculous, irrelevant, and there is nothing, nothing in the history of any race, of any kingdom, or any political structure that would have any relevance whatsoever 432,000 years after it was created. There, It's ridiculous. I can't even believe people do not assess this. They don't I can't even believe like Billy Carson. How can you tell people that? It's crazy. But if you go by the old draconian system, which is a day count, 432,000 shars becomes 12 centuries. Now we have cross-reference with Hindu and ancient Arabic texts, which say that the gods ruled before the flood for 12 centuries. Now we have compatibility with the historical record. Don't take Jason's word for it. Look at my sources. I don't make anything up, my friends. This is this is some deep, deep chronographical material. When you study the history of the world using chronographical materials, it all fits like a perfect puzzle. But you can't read Graham Hancock to get that. And you sure as hell are not going to get it from Zechariah Sitchin or anybody who promotes Sitchin's work. So you got to get it by doing the long math. You got to do it like I did. Just sit for years and just study study history with a calculator and cite every single chronographical source. Like Franz Boas said in 1881, record enough facts and the, and the answers will fall to you like ripe fruit. I, I, I quote him a lot because it's true. It, it's true. It's uh, the reason people don't make all the connections that I do is because they haven't recorded all the facts that I've recorded. But once you have all those facts, it all falls into place and it's irrefutable. Nobody can argue with you. They can only argue with your sources. But when they go to arguing with this source, they have a problem because these three over here said the same thing. Are they going to spend their lives? Anybody who attacks the archaics research, I'm not worried about it because you're going to spend your entire life having to invent arguments because this is a shut book case and I stand behind it. Still waiting for that, that critical review too. So especially for the Phoenix research. So, I mean, it's easy for anybody on YouTube to, I mean, it's so easy uh, to create a YouTube channel just to critique people's theories because those guys, they don't have, they don't possess any imagination. They're not bringing anything to the world. They're just taking from it. And those guys are really easy to refute. I'm waiting for one of them. Sooner or later, sooner or later, I'm going to catch me a chicken and, and you guys are going to see a whole new Jason come out and the videos that I will release after I am attacked are not going to be anything anything comparable to what I've so far released. I still need to release my Phoenix thesis too, because I really need some uh, people to look at it. The source materials don't lie. It's simple as that. Our world, our world suffers resets every 138 years. And I will never be made to believe anything otherwise. However, you guys have to take into consideration that some of you are employing the 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 meaning of reset to you is not the same one that I've published. I have a different interpretation to reset than about 99.9 percent .9 of all the material that I'm seeing on YouTube and Facebook. So let's be clear right now what a reset is. Every 138 years, our holography has materials, phenomena, situations, people, and structures that are removed. At the exact same time that phenomena, situations, concepts, material, people, and structures suddenly appear. That's a reset. A reset is not... There has been four resets, and I, I have videos that explain the difference in uh, resets. I have type 1, type 2, and type 3 resets. For those of you who don't know, you need to go back and watch my, my Phoenix videos. But type 1, type 2, and type 3 resets are the, are the three type of resets that Phoenix does every 138 years. 
And I, it's only been four times in world history, only four times that we have suffered a type three reset. Most of them are just type one, type two. So 19, like 1902 was just type one. A lot of stuff suddenly just vanished from the historical record, but a lot and a lot of new stuff all of a sudden appeared. Excuse me, 1902 was type two, not type one, it was type two. The reason it was type two is because we have a lot, and I have three videos about all the natural or unnatural phenomena that happened in 1902. It wasn't just a type one where all these different things were, were being taken out and new edits were, the, the edit involved a lot of materials uh, inter interpolated into our holography. It was a type two also because of all the strange phenomena that happened. And not just the volcanoes and the earthquakes, but we had red mud and red rain and red dust fallout all over the world. And scientists, scientists looked at it and they found that it was 65% compatible with organic materials. Very rare. Uh, in some countries like Italy, they swore up and down that they were looking at blood corpuscles. So strange, strange. It's almost like the whole world is an organism. We're just inside of it. Oh, don't, don't let that be the next YouTube theory. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, coffee time. <clears throat> Read some of these. I'm sorry if, in, I'm sorry if, uh, if I don't get to all the questions, because I, I, you guys know, I, I don't have a real, a real focus. I'm going to entertain tangents as they pop in my head. Stephanie, or Steffi, who do you think is taking care of our bodies outside the construct? Okay, we're deviating away from Anunnaki theory now, going back into simulation theory, which is fine. We can, we, we can separate the two only, only so much because they are interrelated. So, uh, I'm going to have to say exactly what I've always said in my other presentations. In the beginning... God made man in his own image. That necessarily implies to me that humans made humans to live in the simulacrum. I believe that humans, with you, we're, we're in a human avatar inside of here, but we're going to be human or humanoid on the outside as well. Now, uh, yeah, I just don't, I don't think it's going to be any different. Uh, I believe now the type of human we are on the outside is going to be very different as well. We might have 100% of our DNA activated. There is no junk DNA. There is no latent DNA. There is no dormant DNA. It might be everything going. And if that's the case, then we're going to be like X-Men. We're going to be fantastically powerful and to be given a body that has supernatural capabilities to be able to do all kinds of things in any biosphere it comes in contact with this means that the oversoul would need to be able to trust you with such a inheritance to be able to trust you with a body that is immortal an avatar that can do all these wonderful things means that he needs to develop, or she needs to develop a system by which he or she can guarantee that by the time you're done with your initiation, that you will have a personality that, that deserves such an inheritance. So well, I'm going to leave it with that. Let's see. I don't know what ascended masters are. I've seen the term stereo freak, stereo frequency. So then do you find any credence to the ascended masters, uh, Inky and Lil? Listen, <clears throat> when you take the chronological material that the Jews preserved in the book of Jasher, book of Jubilees, and the book of Genesis, and you put it all together and you make a chart, you find out that Enoch appeared in the Genesis narrative 12 centuries before the flood. His father was named Arid. In English, it's Jared, but the word in Hebrew means to descend, as if something came down from the mountain or something came down from the sky. In the book of Enoch, it was, it was, it was Mount Arnon. Uh, the watchers came from the mountain. Now, and I, and I have described in many of my presentations what was happening. They knew of the reset. 
the Nemesis X object reset in uh, in 3439 BC, and they were underground. And after it was over, they came up. The entrance to the mountain is very high. When they came down the mountain, they were regarded as gods. This is the story of the Book of Enoch. They called them the Watchers, and the Watchers brought everything, technology and irrigation and aqueducts and, and astrology, astronomy, uh, domestication of animals. They brought all the stuff to the people. This is the story of the Book of Enoch. It's a story of many ancient traditions, actually. It is the story of the Anuna. So Enki was a benefactor. Enki, oh, the reason I'm telling you about that is about Enoch is because that's exactly where you find it in the Sumerian chronology. No, you don't find it in the Billy Carson, Zechariah Sitch, and Graham Hancock version of history. No, but you find it in the Eudoxus version of history, which is the accurate one. The one where you translate units in according to the culture that was existing at the time. And during the vapor canopy at the time, the only timekeeping system known to man back then was the day count system. That's all they counted was the rotation of the stars. How the circumpolar stars revolved around Alpha Draconis once a day. So this is why Genesis is very, very clear in the very beginning. It says, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Then all these things happen, and it says, and the evening and the morning was the second day. Then a whole bunch of other things happen, and then the evening and the morning was the third day. Genesis is hammering into you, just like the Oral End manuscript, just like so many other ancient texts that all describe the same thing. In the old time, men counted the days and years were unknown to them. Yeah, when you, when you apply days, then Zechariah Sitchens and the Sumerian king list, 432,000 shars from the appearance of Enki to the Great Flood matches the 12 centuries because 432,000 divided by 360 days a year is exactly 12 centuries. Everything lines up perfectly. Now, these chronographical studies line up perfectly with each other, the Jewish and the Babylonian. Here they are. I just told you. Which now you can add, add the Hindu. You can add the Maya. You can add, you can, you can, all these accretions from the different studies can now be added to this template. And that's what I have done. Many of you have seen, so a lot of you have purchased and I've given away to hundreds of you. You have got my charts for free. You have seen the charts that I have done. I show extensive charts where all these calendars developed, how they all came into existence at the same time, and they, how they moved through history. Almost every calendar from the old world was developed in the, in, the, in the lifetime of Enki, or in the later traditions, in the lifetime of Enoch. We have the exact same person. A lot of I've had a lot of people triggered too, telling me there's no way Enoch and Enki are one. You're, uh, you're tripping. You know, I've had a lot of people tell me I don't care. I don't care what they say. My videos show that Enki and Enoch are absolutely. If you, if you just look at the sources, if you if you quit being triggered and responding to your Zechariah Sitchin emo, emotional attachment and just look at the facts, you will see. Damn, and you might learn something because. Zechariah Sitchin's books are good as far as the ar archaeology, all the things that have been found from the old world. But when it comes to chronology, he employed uniformitarian principles, which are Freemason. That's Freemason. It's a Freemason education. In order to believe in the evolutionary natural, natural selection, uniformitarian view of history, you can't be a catastrophist. But you have to be a catastrophist when you see evidence here, 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 all throughout history that almost the entire world's been obliterated multiple times. So we can't ignore the fact. You can't be a uniformitarianism and accept the fact that on display right now in museums all over the world are fossilized jellyfish, earthworms, dragonflies caught in mid-flight with their wings petrified fossils of the interior of clams with their shells closed. These are impossibilities under the uniformitarian model. But under the catastrophist model, we know now how spider webs have been imprinted in rock. Under the catastrophist view, we know exactly why a layer of iridium has been found all over around the world. In the catastrophist view, we can understand how radio halos, what was that flash? I have no idea what that flash was, but it was in my studio. One of you guys took a picture of me. 
I'm going to go down to the bottom of this thread and make sure I'm still on. Let me know if y'all can still hear me. That was a weird flash like a camera. It was like my own computer took a picture of me. Y'all saw that? Wow. Okay. YouTube took a picture of me. Anyway, back to what I'm saying is you have to be a catastrophist if you're going to make sense of any of this data. The entire world was flash frozen. We have, and in, my, and in my videos, you can see this. I have videos about this where I show over a hundred pictures of fossils that should not exist. Of fish eating other fish. Flash frozen in the act of eating another fish. Yeah, animals and snakes in the middle of fighting each other when they were completely frozen. Delicate ferns in the bottom, in the bottom of the ocean that were flash frozen. Yeah, it's crazy. The suction cups on, on the bottom of squids found petrified. Under the uniformitarian model, the theory of evolution, petrification can only occur when, when uh, creatures with bones are deposited. And then under pressure, the surrounding silicates replace the organic decomposing materials. That's bullshit. Because that would never explain how we have fossils of butterfly wings. How is that possible? Earthworms. It's not possible. In my, in my records, I've got so many different examples of jellyfish, spiders, creatures that don't have skeletal structures. And yet, a lot of these, a lot of these fossils are anatomically perfect. They're not the skeletons. It's the whole creature. So, yeah, it just doesn't work. Uniformitarianism doesn't work. It's a Freemason education. It's all bullshit. But Zechariah Sitchin went with that model. I can't go with that. I can't go with that. No, I, I can't do that. My little old 80s, 80s retro trip right there. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the whole world being flash frozen, and all of a sudden something in here took a picture of me. That's crazy. 1242 people listening. That's a Phoenix number. 1242, I can't remember what it is, 138 times 8 or 138 times 9, something like that. Now it went down to 1237, so I must have pissed somebody off. Anyway, hey, if you guys like this disser dissertation while I'm over here sweating my ass off, smash that like button because we're not done. I'm, I'm going to ride this out. Anyway, liking and sharing my videos hel helps me, guys. You got to understand, I'm on an agenda. I'm on an agenda to spread this data, to spread this information everywhere. If I could spend so many years of my life sitting down, I'm not doing anything, but I'm not working a job, I'm not dating, I'm not, I'm not, I have no social life, I'm not doing anything but the preservation and the recording and the assimilation of information to be able to present it the best way I can, then you should feel obligated to to share it. It's, it's, you shouldn't just keep it to yourself. So I, I hope I'm not imposing myself on you, but it's just something that I believe. And, and if there's anything that I truly believe, you know it's going to come out of my mouth because that's what kind of personality I have. I'm not going to keep anything from you. When it comes to the when it comes to the Anuna histories, the reason Zechariah Sitchin and so many other people weren't accurately depicting exactly what the historical record conveys is because they would be branded as racist today. And another problem we have is the fact that Zechariah Sitchin represents a culture of people who have never told the truth when it concerns history, who have never told the truth when it concerns the origin of our biblical materials, and they have never told the truth concerning the one other group of people in the world that they absolutely despise and they have been at a cultural war with for almost 38 centuries. Yes, it's very old. Zechariah Sitchin is Jewish. Not all Jewish people are bad at all. Just like not all Caucasians are racist. It's the same, the same principle applies. But there is a, there is a subculture within Judaism that uh, they have basically been in control of the publishing industry and the entertainment industry, the information industry for the past 100 years. This is, that's who they are. And this is the reason why Zechariah Sitchin, Emmanuel Velikovsky, and many others cannot accurately say many of the things that they have found in history. So I can't lay to the charge of Zechariah Sitchin that he deliberately deceived people, but I do know this, 
the structuring of Zechariah Sijin's presentations are nothing like Thor Heyerdahl's for a reason. They're not like Samuel Noah Kramer's. They're not like Ignatius Donnelly's. The reasoning is, is the Jewish frame of reference is a supremacist reference. They, they have basically mapped out throughout the Bible that they are God's chosen people. Everybody else is inferior. It is the Jew first and then the Gentile. And when you're dealing with a culture of people who believe this and they are told this all their lives when they're a youth and they go up and they live in a world that the media continues to perpetuate that idea, they don't publish historical accuracy. They publish it through a Jewish filter. And that's the problem. So you guys need to Go listen to the Anuna Files videos. And I'm telling you now, I'm speaking more openly because now 100% of all my videos have been distributed. I really don't have a fear of censorship anymore because the more I'm censored, the more I'm just going to pop up on more, more, more and more different platforms. So YouTube may as well just leave me here so they can basically monitor, monitor the output because I have no problem migrating to another, to another platform. And when I migrate to that platform, then I won't be censored so much. Then there will be a lot more freedom in what I convey. So, so it's a, so basically it's, it's a win-win. So it's a win-win when the day comes, when it's time to go to another platform, we'll go. And I hope you guys follow me. Anyway, let's go. All right. Thanks for those donations, guys. I really appreciate it. Wish I could personally thank each individual. All right. Looking for another question. Let me go way the back up here again, because this thread is moving. I don't want to miss questions, but I know I already have. And it won't let me go so far up. Yeah, bison flash frozen food in the mouth throat. Yeah, you're right. Not just the bison. Uh, it's Rudy and the dogs. Hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Rudy and the dogs, you're right. It's not just. It's also mammoths and mastodons and tree sloths. Megafauna have been found all over the northern hemispheres. And they, yeah, that's, that's the northern hemisphere. I, I believe the last count, it was estimated that 2.2 million mammoths are, are in the Siberian tundra. Now there are there are stories from the 1920s and 30s that that local like Eskimo types in Siberia they were they were they were digging them out, thawing them out, and eating the mammoth meat, and it was still fresh. That could only happen if they were flash frozen. And what's interesting is buttercups are found undigested in the mouths and throats and on the tongues of the frozen mammoths. That area wasn't a tundra when that flash freezing happened. right the first roxy your thoughts on how trees can take our worries well that's not really the subject matter of this video but i'm going to tell you right now i've already done a video on that it's called there is power in the groves if you want to know if you want to know about the exchange of information and dynamics between a tree and the informed field of a human and how you can use a tree to do things, then you need to listen to that video. It's called There is Power in the Groves. Looking for a question. Okay. An Anonymous. <laughs> That's a good one. A-N and then Anonymous. Could it be possible that all souls here on this plane of sim simulation are being quarantined to be cleaned before the soul could exit the matrix? You, sir, have not been watching all my presentations, but I forgive you because that is my conclusion. We're living through life sims. We are developing an immortal personality because the final avatar that we're going to get is going to be godlike. And in order to receive such an inheritance, then it must be, we must be proven to be worthy of that, trustworthy, because this is just an initiation. This is what the holy mysteries were about in the Orphic faith, in the Delphic faith, in the in, in the in the ancient in, in the ancient stage plays. This is the story that was told. This is who we are. 
this is all a test. Every bit of this isn't even important. None of the historical details are, but it's in analyzing the historical details that we realize we're in a construct. Were we, were we supposed to ever discover we were in a construct? Maybe not. Maybe so. But in the end, it never, it never matters because these life sims are going to unfold with the development of the immortal personality. Then you'll get your, then when this simulacrum collapses, which this is all about, that's when you'll receive your avatar, your real, your real immortal avatar. Let's see. Looking for another one hour and 35 minutes. Oh, I still got some gas in me. That's right. No fear. I wish I could. I wish I could convey to you guys enough what fear does. The 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 entire that negative default programming that takes over people when they get up in the morning and they fall into a depression and they go out and they carry that informed field of fear with them all day. If you only knew what you're attracting to yourself, it's just you got you got to be fearless. You got to be fearless in everything you do, in everything you teach, in every in every in every in every interaction with other humans. You got to be fearless. And believe me, if you truly are fearless, it doesn't matter what situation you're in, you enter into, because everything around you, not just other personalities, but even the informed fields of physical objects around you, will yield. They will understand that. Okay, this is right. This is an untouchable one. Yeah, man. You guys just don't know fear is the only thing that keeps you separated from every single thing you want in life. All right. Steffi, this totally explains how I have a mini poodle that's supposed to come from a wolf. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. That's, that's the message of the original Sphinx. The original Sphinx was a canine. It was a dog. You look at the Sphinx today, and the head is so disproportionate from the body. And that's because the pharaohs removed the original head and replaced it with a carved down version of the one that's there now. Thank you, Cole Spiracy. Hey, Jason, what's your opinion on meditation? What's your opinion on meditation? Well, I've, I've addressed that in prior videos as well. I just, meditation is important for you, for, for you to tap into the frequency that you're looking for, especially uh, a breathing meditation. But I'm not on board with the Tibetan style meditation. I am not on board with wasting your life sitting Indian style doing absolutely nothing and yet claiming you're holy or that, or that you're, you're, abs you're accomplishing something because you're in stasis. You're not. The only meditation that I do is when I realize that, oh, shit, thing, things just, three or four things just happen back to back to me and all of them negative or perceived to be negative. So I, I know I'll stop myself. And say, Wait a minute. Because slow, deep breaths oxygenating our avatar for some reason, and it's been known for thousands of years, completely alters and heightens our frequency. Once you're vibrating at a higher frequency, you've completely divorced yourself from the negative default programming that the collective suffers. When I find myself resonating with the collective, I have to stop. I got to stop and get away from whoever it is that's making me, because uh, uh, I, I feel it's a physical reaction that I have to other people when they are being negative or they're being, yeah, it's, it, this is, this has gone on with me for years now. Because once you wake up every single morning with a positive attitude, as soon as you come into contact with somebody with a negative attitude, you have a physical reaction. You actually start to feel nauseous. And this is what happens to me. It overcomes me. And I, I got to get away. I got I to I I get away, take some deep breaths, and I got to get that I got to get that frequency range back up. That's the only meditation that I need. Because if I was to sit down and meditate for an hour, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Because... When I close my eyes, I lose. Well, as soon as you close your eyes, you basically separate yourself from all physicality. You're still physically there, but now you become hyper aware to the thought field. If you believe thoughts come from your brain, then 
there's not a whole lot I can tell you. I can teach you. Um, if you haven't watched my prior presentations where I demonstrate that thoughts come from around you, they're in the thought field. And this is why several inventions were done at the exact same time by different people in different languages who had no contact. The thought field generates ideas. And if you want to tap into the thought field, then you can. Just close your eyes, sit Indian style, meditate, and slow breathe. And as you do that, you'll, all these thoughts are going to come. But I'm telling you now, not one of them is yours. They're invasive. This is how the collective receives information from basically artificial intelligence eggs and the simulacrum. This is how the collective uh, passes information. People think the ideas and thoughts are their own. They're not. They're not. Not when they're in that state of meditation. But when you're doing something, those thoughts are yours. Those thoughts are absolutely yours. You need to learn the difference between your thoughts and the thoughts that invade your mind. Because that right there is going to be very instructive for you. And if you spend a lot of time meditating, you're absorbing the thoughts of the collective. That's not healthy. That's not good at all. Your meditations should be only long enough for you to get your frequency up. Get that deep breath. It doesn't take long. It only takes me about two minutes of deep breathing, slow, and all of a sudden I feel good again. No longer resonating on the negative. Yeah, I don't believe. I think long-term med meditation is harmful. And uh, 10,000 Tibetan, Tibetan monks on the, in, in the Himalayas on the side of a hill that are, are trying to tell me otherwise, all I can all I can do is look back over the history of the past 2,000 years and see what see what these Tibetan monks have accomplished. Chinese invasions, the loss of their libraries. Yeah, I'm not I'm not on board with it, uh, and I'm speaking from personal experience. Meditation doesn't do anything to me, but in, but create an invasive all these thoughts coming out from from the exterior. If you want to know more about this with other frames of reference that are probably more palatable than my own, you might want to read Stalking the Wild Pendulum or A Brief Tour of Higher Consciousness. Both of these books are small, very well written, and they're, pu and they're written by Ishak Bintov. Um, those, are, those are some really good books about the thought field. Let's see. I don't know anything about the Devil's Mountain. Never been there. I've seen pictures of it. Louis Abreu, hey, how you doing? How you doing, bud? Did the Anunnaki have been, were they dropped here by the simulacrum like an insert of information? Listen, I one of my videos, I can't remember which one, but I cite the book and the researcher that said this. But he showed evidence that there is there is more evidence that cultures and races suddenly appeared in our world. With, with, with past memories intact, already implanted, and there may, may have been a two or three day uh, confu confusion event, and then they all started do, working together, doing their thing, and you know, after six or seven weeks, they're like, they don't even remember that something unusual had happened, like they had just been created, and uh, put into the, put, put into this, this construct, uh, he, he, I can't remember, it's in one of my videos, I think it's one of the Anunophiles videos where I discussed this guy and what he had said, but it was very interesting to me because he's right. There is no evidence of slow transitional development. There is no evidence. This is why the scientific community has had to do these lies like the Piltdown Man. Anybody know about that one? Where the scientific community foisted for 50 or 60 years, they put out evolution is true. The, Pilt Man, the Piltdown Man proves it. Evolution is true. Here's a hominid. Here's the hominid bones. Then you come to find out that it's almost all plaster of Paris, and it was all built and constructed by an artist off of a bone fragment, which was genetically tested recently and found to be a pig bone. Yeah, that's the scientific establishment. Did the, scienti did the scientific establishment ever go back to the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s in the last 20 years and rewrite any of the history books based off the fact that that DNA is a pig bone? No, they didn't. They're still going with evolution. Because that was just a fallacy they put out. But they've put out hundreds of fallacies and they've been busted. But it doesn't matter. When you control the publishing industry, you control the flow of information, whether that information is true or not. So, 
you believe in Zechariah Sitchin's version of history, then you believe you came from a monkey. Simple as that. And I just can't take anybody. I'm sorry. I can't even do a podcast. I can't even talk to somebody. Uh, I I just can't. I can't understand. I can't, I can't process how anybody could look at themselves and see how dynamic and beautiful constructed the, the human avatar is and our cognitive abilities, our ability at intuition, the predecessor of knowledge, at empathy, the ability to feel emotions, although I'm not experiencing the same thing you are. That's awesome. That is a byproduct of imagination. How can you employ these three spiritual fac faculties and then sit there and look me in the eye and say, you know that you descended from a chimpanzee. That is astonishing. You are a special breed of stupid. And I can't talk to you. It's just simple as that. Let's see. Oh, let's find some questions here. Oh... Okay, I need to I need to address this. Louis Abreu, did the internet key have been dropped here by this Miller Crumb like an answer? Okay, I need to finish this. I need to finish that. Let me tell you something. The Sumerian king list, the structuring, the structuring of the Akkadian is very unusual. I drop Iridu. And then it continues on with the king list, and it names the kings and how many shars they ruled and all that. Then I drop Larak. Then it names the kings and the dynasties that ruled Larak and the different situations that happened in, before the flood. And then I drop Shurapak. And it goes off and describes the uh, what was going on in Sumerian times at that time. The Sumerian king list is very interesting because it's describing that these cities were dropped from the sky. Yes. Now remember, in the prophetic, in the eschatology, that's what we have. We have in the book of Revelation the return of a city to the world. Well, actually, it's two of them. One of them is Nemesis X object. It's called Wormwood in the Revelation narrative. It's in 2046 that a vast super construction is going to impact North America. Now, I've gone through this and sh shared the data sets and everything I believe about that in the Anuna files. So, uh, that's the first one, but that's the losers. Then the winner, the chief cornerstone, his city descends after the apocalypse is over. Remember the remember in the in the uh, Genesis record we have an eschatology reference. It says, "And Abraham went to Egypt to look for a city whose whose builder and maker was God." Here we have a reference to something in Egypt that was dropped from the sky. So this parallels the Sumerian records, which parallels the prophecies about what, what the apocalypse is about. It's about waking up a certain, a certain group within the collective as the collective suffers the events of the apocalypse. And then at the end of the apocalypse, we have the descent of the chief cornerstone, which parallels the prophecies of the coming of a city from the sky. In my father's house are many mansions, anyone? So these, 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 these things all tie in. It's a great question, man. These things all tie in together. Now, in the, in the Judaic version, they call it New Jerusalem. And that's fine, because we already know that the Christian records were written through a Semitic lens. We get that. But remember what the archaics research is about. I don't care about the Judaic filters. I don't care about the Christian filters. I don't care about what the cultural attachments are. I document common denominators. I document the parallels. This is what we do. We can strip away all the racial and cultural attachments, and we have the situation that the vapor canopy world enjoyed a dynasty of 670 years, which is precisely 241,200 shards. Under the draconian calendar of the vapor canopy, one day, one turning of the stars, 
So, 241,200 turnings of the stars, according to the Sumerian king list, is exactly how long the seven kings ruled from five cities that dropped from the sky. I drop Eridu, Larak, Badtabira, Shurapak, and I'm forgetting one of them. There's another one. I forgot. It. But there's five of them. It's, it's called by scholars the Pentopolis. Five cities. So, yeah, 241,200 shards divided by 360 days or stellar counts of the old vapor canopy system. There it is right there. 670 years exactly. Which is very close to the Chinese dynasty of the Dragon Kings, which was 646 years. Same thing. It was just it was a Chinese version of the older Sumerian text. Same exact same. So Lewis Abreu, I hope that I hope that adds some clarity to you. Uh, when, I, when I'm discussing these things, you really need to, if I don't do it, you need to do it. You need to strip away all the cultural and racial attachments and just stick with the core fundamentals because they all, they all match. We're talking about technology after the apocalypse, after, after the technological infrastructure of our world has collapsed through the Phoenix phenomenon and then the, the fall of a super construction, which was probably a city, a super construction in the sky that, that impacts North America, there's going to be a 60-year period. During that 60 years of uh, apocalypse and development, there's going to be a choice the human family is going to have to make. Yeah, it's, it's, it gets pretty, it's, it gets very interesting. Isaac, Isaac Newton thought things were really going to come to a head in 2061. He may have a point. I've already isolated 2070 as the date that the elect, the errants, are sealed. And that right there is a very significant event. It must happen before the return of the chief cornerstone, and it must happen before the 144,000 prophets can be unleashed during the apocalypse. Because they have a very specific ministry, but they can't they can't begin that ministry until the number of, of the sealed, the number of the stones are 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 complete. That's that's what the symbol of the Great Pyramid is. Every single stone is a soul of man. It is an errant that has been sealed into the structure. Remember, in my father's house are many mansions. A lot of these prophecies speak in code. So. Another question. Nice quote, Rachel Osborne. Interesting. Starman. Well, I ain't seen that movie in a long time. I haven't seen it since the 80s. Starman. So... <clears throat> Uh, y'all know that y'all know that Jay of Jay Dreamers and I we're buddies. I like that dude. I, I really I, I really vibe on his his uh his energy. Uh, the plasma apocalypse. I'm on I'm on board generally that what he's on what he's unveiled about the plasma apocalypse to me is I'm hundred percent convinced that what everything he's he's describing is the major the big Phoenix events. Yeah. But not the smaller ones. Not all the little 138 year small ones. Might be the same mechanism, but not the same magnitude that Jay, Jay Dreamers is discussing. So uh, he and I, he and I are buddies, man. I make I make I go when he's doing lives, I'll pop in on the chats and all that. But uh, I don't do truth in movies. I don't I don't. You guys know my my research isn't about that. Uh, I do believe that Hollywood unveils the truth through fiction because that's what the Bible is. That's what many ancient records are. Uh, it's also the reason why I, okay, I, I too have done that. I'm guilty of that too. These are my fantasy books. You guys don't know that when I was in prison, I wrote, I wrote a very, very deep fantasy seven book series about a fairy apocalypse in a world called Dagathar. I originally titled it the Oroclon Chronicles and, uh, this is this right here is nothing but 10,000 years of chronological events leading up to the seven book series. This is nothing but a chronology of all all the main characters. Some of my characters are thousands of years old. The whole I, I basically invented about 60 something different fairy creatures that cannot be found in any other books. Very creative. 
I spent a lot of time on maximum security. As I told you guys, I wasn't always researching. In my fun time, I was actually creating. I was building maps and worlds. And, and uh, I was I planned on, upon my release, releasing a fantasy books. They're on Amazon. But uh, anyway, long story short, I did the same thing. A lot of my beliefs are very deep and they're difficult to grasp for people because the frames of reference that, that you were raised with aren't the same ones that I'm coming from. So I put a lot of my beliefs about the history of the world and this world, this construct that we live in, they're right here. As a matter of fact, there is nothing on my YouTube channel that even goes near as deep as what I believe what's on the outside of this construct and that where we really come from as I discuss in this book what the fairies know, the secrets of the fairies, what they know about humans. This book is deep. Now, many of you who are listening to me now have ordered this book and read it. Y'all have told me. Uh, the I have the first five books out as e-books or small, but actually I was really thinking about, somebody had told me recently that instead of just releasing the books like you are, because it's going to take you years to get your material out, you got too much on your plate. And they're right. I'm not going to get to releasing any more of these anytime soon. But what I can do and what I've thought about is I have another YouTube channel. I do. I just never put anything on it. It's just sitting there. I was thinking about Go ahead. I'm going to go ahead like I did the, the law scriptures, the first third of the law scriptures book. Just y'all give me some ideas. Y'all, y'all send me some messages and emails, not in the, not in the comment thread, but put them in the comments below or email me. Would that be something you're interested in? And I will just read the books on YouTube. Cause that would, I can get them out very fast. If every evening I'm just reading for an hour and uploading the video because actually the entire story fills a cardboard box of manuscripts talking about six, 7,000 pages. It's a epic. It's way more complex and far longer with more action and, and deeper philosophies than you'll ever find in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I spent a lot of time building this world and building these characters. But if that's something you guys would like, then I would just release the video. I just read them, read them on YouTube. And, uh, because actually getting them all typeset and organizing all my notes, hell, I can't even keep up with archaics. I would never be able to finish all this. I wouldn't. I even thought about giving them away to another author who would just go ahead and get them out. Somebody who has nothing else to do. But the problem is, I got some really awesome imaginative material in there that I don't think someone else can come behind me and just and just rewrite. Not from my notes. Not from what I envisioned. So, I don't know. Oh, it's just one of those things I may never get to. Oh, uh, don't let me know if that's something you, you would want to do. Because I can actually release them on YouTube very fast. I just read them, read them and upload them, read them and upload them. I can have the whole set. I can have the whole the whole thing like that. Anyway, I'm looking for another. Uh, oh, I told. I'm telling you that because truth and fiction. I'm a believer in that. I believe that we absorb more material through fictive means, and and we and we process the information much better knowing it came from a fantasy setting than reality. And I mean, I don't. I don't even have to pr give you any proof of that. You already know. Many, 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 many authors have employed that technique. Let's see. Can't the history be holographic and mathematically perfect and be other explanation other than sim simulation? That's okay. Uh, Portugal. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Is that Yao Rocha? I don't know, but you're from Portugal. Okay, listen, he's asking me, can the history of our holographic world, well, can the history be holographic and mathematically perfect and yet be an, an explanation other than being a simulation? Okay, yes. Why, why is the, why does archaics push simulation? Because the mathematical structuring that I have found and documented in Chronicon and many of my published books and all my videos tells me that we live in an artificial construct. Now, I am coming from the most sophisticated frame of reference that I am capable of doing. If somebody else, and I have mentioned this in, a, in one or two prior videos, in the future, someone else may assess all this data and because we've evolved into a new type of technology, someone else may say, we're not in a simulation. We're in one of these. Bam. But at this point, 
our own frames of reference in the collective can't go beyond a virtual reality setting. They can't go beyond a simulated context. If you, Mr. Rosha, can come up with a concept that would explain all these enigmas and anomalies and not be a simulated world, I'm open to that interpretation. And I would definitely greet that with open arms and I would take it as far as it can go because I'm going to be honest in, in all my assertions. I will never be accused of, of cherry picking my data. This is the one thing Charles Fort said, said a lot about. He said, who would not be a prize marksman if only his hits were recorded? Charles Fort was talking about the scientific community because that's what they do. See, when the scientific community publishes a report, it's after doing like 200 experiments. When they do 200 experiments, they'll get like 80 of them that basically give out one set of data, one set of output. Then they'll have about 40 of them give out this output, 30 of them give out this output, 25 of them give out this output. Then they can legally say that their output was this, the 80. And they don't even mention that 120 exercises produced data that did not comport with this 80, these 80 findings. Do you understand how manipulated that is? 80 was the main one that they got. 80 times that this happened. But 120 times they didn't. But they don't have to cite that. The reason is, is because that 120 is compartmentalized into the, well, these 40 here are different than these 30, and these 30 are different than these 25. These 25 are different than these 15. These 15 are different than this 10, 10, 10, 10, and 10. So they can omit the data and, and tell the public that we know this is true because we ran experiments, and out of those experiments we read, all 80 of these right here came out to this date. That's how the scientific community publishes information. Yeah. So, and you're talking to somebody who's gone deep. I've got, I've got hardback books from 1939 of Smithsonian reports. Yeah, I've got source book project, nothing but scientific, scientific uh, anomalies, mysterious universe. Man, I'm, I'm drowning in books. Some of these behind me I have not read yet. That's why they're in my library. But the books that I have read are in my bibliography, and you've all seen that. Those of you who have been on my channel a while. Good question, Portugal. If you come up, if you come up with a, a new, a new, a new uh, concept, I will entertain it. Something that fits all the facts, one hundred percent. I'm on board, brother. Hmm. Okay, this is a good one. Rustic reflection. How many iterations of mankind have existed on this planet prior? Okay, let's go with the evidence. We have, we have evidence, and I've cited this in, in uh, my Anuna files, that there was a civilization that existed for 930 years and was completely obliterated by cataclysm. This is the one that the science world calls Cro-Magnon. These are these the what we know of as Cro Cro-Magnon are the few colonies of survivors who lived in caves when this cataclysm is the only safe place to be. They survived in caves, and when they were there, they painted all these elaborate things. They slowly died out. But the Cro-Magnon lived in a bifurcated biosphere. It was a biosphere that contained two principal races. One of them was an older race that was here before the Cro-Magnon suddenly appeared. The Cro-Magnon are not genetically connected to this other race. This other race is primitive, feral. They are the Neanderthal. Then we have the Cro-Magnon. Then, then we have select subcultures of the Cro-Magnon like Aurignacian, Mag Magdalenian. Whoa. Texas like a desert. So, anyway, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, Adamu. Then among the Adamu, 
we have we do have the mystery. We have we have we have a unique mystery for which uh, I really don't like talking much about it because uh, there isn't anything in the historical record. You can't find any texts that talk about uh, uh, basically sub-Saharan Africa from Nubia on on south. The whole histories of the black race. They've been here forever. We don't have any histories of them, though. There are no books, no libraries from the ancient world. There's no sites in Africa that you can excavate by which you can find out anything that of literary value, anything of chronological value. There's nothing there. The dark continent is all is not just dark racially. It is dark in history. We have no we have nothing. There's just nothing there. We can't we can't we can't find out any information now. We do have a widespread, the Adamu were, were like dark red skinned. The best approximation I can give you is what you find on the Egyptian temples of Karnak of what the Egyptians looked like. The Egyptians had straight black hair, smooth skin, could not grow beards. This is why pharaohs had wooden beards. This is why in China, the dragon kings, although the oriental people don't really grow beards, they had great beards. It's because the Anuna were depicted by the Sumerians with large goggle eyes. This is where the origin of the watcher comes from. And they were depicted with skinned race that came that came among them. The Sumerians described themselves totally different. The Sumerians described themselves as, and very proudly, the black-headed people. Thor Heyerdahl has noticed from different historical and archaeological accounts that the Sumerians were no different than the people of Egypt, the people of the Harappan civilization in, in Pakistan, India. They're no different than the Chinese Yangtze Valley. Chinese pictograms and early Sumerian proto prototypes look very, very similar. And there's many studies on that. These people were no different than those in the Urumbaba Valley of South America. It seems that most of the world was populated with people who had jet black straight hair and olive skin that could not grow facial hair or much hair on their bodies, period. Then introduce the Anuna, tall, hairy, bearded people, and just like Orientals today, who always draw in their cartoons and Japanese anime, what do you see? White people are always depicted with goggle eyes, big over eyes. It's overcompensation. It's the same thing that Caucasians do in their artwork when they're depicting cartoons of Oriental people. Their almond eyes, all of a sudden, with the with the epi, the uh, what's the epigenetic? What is it called? There's an epifold. The almond eye is created from a, a genetic deal. It's it, it, it's a uh, cosmetic. There's a rare, there's very good research that it was done. It was entirely genetically, cosmetically done uh, to create the almond eye. But in Caucasian art, when we when we show Oriental people, it's always with slant eyes. They don't have slant eyes at all. They've got almond shaped eyes. But we don't do that overcompensation or exaggeration. So anyway, uh, when the Anuna appeared, they were unlike any of the people on the earth. Basically, we had this one race, the Adamu, that were olive skin to red skin, depending upon where in the world they were living, and they all had jet black hair and black eyes. And that's from China, India, the Near East, all the Mediterranean, called them Iberians, all of the Mediterranean, all of all of North Africa, and then the ancient Americas as well, from Alaska, Canada, North America, Central America, all the way down. Basically the same type. Then the Anuna appeared. The Anuna appeared. But the story and the answer to your question about iterations of humankind is more complex than that. The Mayan Popol Vuh gives us a lot of information about races. It specifically tells us that the gods experimented by creating races of humans out of different materials and putting them in the earth. And then after a while, they would do another experiment and they would create a different type of human out of different materials and release them into the earth. This is the Mayan Popol Vuh. This is not Jason telling you this. So there have been iterations. The 
the uniformitarian view is that every race has developed from all the other ones. But the blood types don't tell us that. They're too diverse. There's too, we, the, the Cro-Magnon originally were claimed to have been descended from the Neanderthal because the uniformitarian view in the 1880s and 1890s and early 1900s, it was easy to get away with that lie. Then the invention of genetics from 1952 to 1962, working out the human genome. Then in the 1980s and 90s and early thousands, we have done genetic testing on all these Cro-Magnon and Neanderthals. And we come to find out, oh boy, just like Piltdown, man, it's all bullshit because there is no, there is no genetic connection between Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal. And that's a problem. That's a problem. Uniformitarianism is absolute bullshit. So, uh, yes, species were brought here. Humans in different races were brought here. The only, the only time that races weren't just instantly created and put here, just like the granite basement rock, the preservation of uh, polonium-238, I've told you that in my other videos, the mystery of the radio halos of polonium, they can't exist. It's impossible. These radio halos are supposed to disappear in the tenth of a second, but they're preserved as if the granite basement rock was created in a flash. It's the only way radio polonium halos can be fossilized in granite. Because if you heat granite up, it becomes rhyolite. Am I being spied on? Is somebody in my computer? That's the second flash. That's the second flash that just hit me coming out of my screen. Wow. There's another one. Somebody's playing with me. Listen, man, if you're in the NSA, you're in one of them alphabet agencies, man, you're just going to have to do what you do because I'm not going to shut up. You're damn who you are. You can watch me on that computer all day long. Might not like what, you, like what you see sometimes, but <laughs> but you can watch all y'all you want to because I don't give a damn. Yeah, that's that's really that's anomalous. That's weird. So anyway, one thousand over a thousand likes. I thank you guys, man. I love you guys. Appreciate it. So yes. There is more evidence that humans and different races have all been planted here in an instant than there is that we have developed or come from anywhere at all. Now, did we come from outside the simulacrum? I don't know. Did we come from continents for which we have no record of today? I don't know. Did we come from underground holding facilities where we have been developed? I don't know. Did we come from chimpanzees? I know damn well I didn't. You have yet to decide for yourself where you came from. Somebody just asked me, uh, what do you think of the anti kathera mechanism? Okay, look, I have followed De Sola. I have read De Sola's conclusions, and I'm very impressed by them. For those of you who don't know, in 1901, uh, sponge divers... Uh, off the coast of Crete, found a shipwreck from 81 BC and, uh, in 1901. In 1902, the wreckage was gone through in a, in a museum basement and a box was separated because they didn't know what it was. In 1902, it was realized that this, this box contained an ancient mechanism, but being underwater for 2,000 years, it had, it had all sealed and crusted together. Now, but it survived. It's called the anti kathera mechanism. Zechariah Sitchin and De Sola both published that they believe that the little Greek marker the, has a, mar marks a special year in history. They don't know why. No researcher has ever been able to show that the anti kathera computer was designed to predict actual eclipses involving the moon or the position of the, sol the, the sun and the sol It's It's a differential geared mechanism, but they don't know exactly what it was designed to measure. I think I figured it out because De Sola, 
the principal archaeologist and scientist who studied it for years, and Zechariah Sitchin's own very unique remarks about it, they isolated the year 584 B.C., Sitchin believed it was 585 BC, but that's only because he's using a Jewish filter. Remember, I'm telling you guys, you got to be very, very cautious about getting information from Jewish authors, man, because of their filters. And what I mean is, is 585 BC is a famous year in, in Jewish history. It is the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon. And it's it's a it's a year that is burned into all all the minds of Jewish historians. So for for Zechariah Sitchin to try to correct De Sola and say now nah, it's probably 585 BC is bullshit. Sola, Sola is 584 BC, but he's one year off. I have shown in my presentations over and over again, the actual year the ancient Greeks would have marked is 583 BC. It is the year not only of the change in the Pythian calendar, but it's also the exact year that the sun darkened and was predicted by Thales of Miletus to darken two years before it happened. And he did this because he had access to records of the Phoenix. Did records of the Phoenix exist back then? Of course they did. 230 years later, Aristarchus had those records and he said the world was destroyed every 2484 years, which is divisible by 138. We know that Thales of Miletus had access to records that we don't have today. He had more access to records that 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 concerned Atreus, and we know Atreus earned the kingship of Argos by predicting the sun darkening over his brother. Uh, there was a contest over the kingship, and he predicted, and he did it the exact year that there was a phoenix darkening of the sun. I brought all this is in my published books. You need to read Nostradamus and the Plants of Apocalypse to go into these details. But the Phoenix chronology has been known to the ancients. It's the reason why we have the Anno Domini calendar today. The AD calendar was specifically created by an agent of the of the Roman Church to hide the Phoenix cycle. And I, I have a video that explains all that. It actually cites those records, shows you the chronology, shows you how all the things that were supposed to have happened in the Justinian plague and all the weird things that happened in the sky actually has started happening in 522. And they covered uh, several years. It was the return of a mini vapor canopy, but it didn't last. Just like 1687 BC when Phoenix destroyed the old Bronze Age and uh uh, the old Heliolithic empires all collapsed all around the world, and this is widely documented, cited, and published and dated by so many different individuals that I'm not even worried about anybody disbelieving that. It's a uh, uh, I cited all those sources. There's more. There's more data about the Great Cataclysm of 1687 BC than anything else that's happened since since in, all from there all the way to 1902. But uh, yeah, move on. I went off on another tangent, guys. I'm really sorry. Talking about a, a real, when it comes to the Anuna, it's just there's so much data. There's so much data to, to, to go in, and it's so easy to get caught up into racial politics. And there's no reason for anybody to get racially triggered. There's not, because we're living in life sims, and every single person listening to my voice has lived multiple lives. You have to. That's how you develop a, a divine personality. The goal line is receiving a new avatar, one that's going to last forever outside the simulacrum. But until you can be afforded su such a prize, you have to show that you're worthy because that avatar can do things that are unbelievable. Yeah, man. If we're made in the image of God, then you have to understand the creation was never a singular event. It's a continuum. Who's going to continue it? Gods are going to continue it. Who are those gods? Don't let me finish that thought. So there is one, okay, there's one deviation in history that is not accounted for in the Mayan Popol Vuh. I was about to get to that a minute ago, that we have all these different races that just suddenly appeared in history, and they have different blood types, and they have different, different physical attributes, and it's not just cosmetic differences. 
we have these these changes as if different human races were living under different biospheres at different times. And when the biosphere changed, that race still stayed here and they adapted, but they're not they're not a hundred percent on par anymore. So that's what we have. But the story of the Anuna alters that paradigm. For the first time in the historical record, we have the we have the introduction of a race that all of a sudden starts interbreeding with the locals that are already here. That creates a new race that basically enters the historical record as technologically advanced, benefactors of civilization. They Everywhere they invade, they, br they bring progress, trade, maritime law. They bring infrastructure. They increase the value of living everywhere they go. This is what happened in the 35th century BC with, with the appearance of the Anuna. Unfortunately, we have these haters of humanity. These people were already well established in Babylon 300 years after the flood, 300 years after the Anuna had vanished. They're here in Babylon. Now, they don't refer to the Anuna as Anuna. They give them a new name. They're now they're Anunnaki. This is where the term Anunnaki came from. It is Babylonian. It is not Akkadian and Sumerian. It's not older. It's of late invention. The Anunnaki all of a sudden are gods. And they're associated with natural phenomena. They're just associated to all kinds of wicked and evil things to instill fear into the people. But the priests decided they're going to save us. I'm speaking from the perspective of someone in Babylon in 18th century BC. The priesthood basically created a system by which we can survive and we can even thrive despite the fact these evil Anunnaki hate us. All we have to do is bring some of our sheep, goats, a little silver, maybe a, maybe a Phoenician bolt of, of cloth and give it to the priests as a sacrifice to the Anunnaki. The priest will intercede and redirect the hatred of the Anunnaki to the enemies of the people. And in this way, substitution theory was born so that the priesthood could maintain control of the people and control the people by using the people's own finances. This system is still with us today. No. Yes. Yes, Red Bull Vodka. Wow. Red Bull and Vodka. Wow. Jason, we have lived multiple lives. So is it possible that we have lived lives as another race? Red Bull Vodka, you, my friend, are new to my channel. I, I have said this many times, that we have been every single race because the oversoul would mandate in the development of empathy, which is a spiritual trait, that we would have to feel and know what it's like to be every race, every culture, at every time period. Because what the oversoul is investing in is a duplicate of itself, a co-creator. And in order to be a co-creator, we have to receive an inheritance that is so powerful that we must be trusted with that type of power. And in order to be trusted with that type of power, we have to have a fully developed personality. Yes. Answer to your question is yes. Let me find some more of these questions. Driftwood. I like that name. Yeah, man. The Agent Smiths have to be careful, though. Fear tactics. No reason for them to exist whether they have legit complaints or not. They need to change tactics. I want to hear what Jason has to say. Matt, you know what? I don't really understand what you're telling me here. The Agent Smiths have to be careful, though. We have to be careful. Fear tactics. No reason for them to exist whether they have legit complaints or not. They need to change tactics. Yeah, Driftwood, I might need you to rephrase that. I'm not, I'm not really following. I'm not really following. 
Okay, I want to address this. Somebody called me you. Me you. What if it were genetic manipulation as what they seem to be doing now? The DNA symbol isn't new. All right, I don't know about the DNA symbol. I don't know about genetic ma manipulation. I want to address the concept that you're bringing to the table right now. And that concept is, is I get a lot of messages and emails from people that begin with a false premise. And it's very hard for me to respond to those. What I mean is, is, is uh, I'll get a lot of emails like, hey, because CERN is doing this and this right now, do you think that's the reason why time is going so fast right now or time is being uh, uh, quickened? Okay. One, I have no evidence that CERN is doing anything other than draining finances. It's a tax. I have no evidence whatsoever that CERN has ever done anything scientific at all. The same thing as NASA. I don't have any personal evidence whatsoever that any of NASA's rockets have ever left the atmosphere. We have ever been to the moon or we have ever sent a satellite anywhere into space. I have no evidence of that. I have CGI images that tell me that happened. I have artist renditions of what the planet Jupiter looks like after thousands of of. of of photographs were taken and, the, and pixelated and all merged together for an artist to then draw a picture of. This is what I have. So this is what you have as well. So I don't, I'm not saying that space ain't, that, that within the construct spaces isn't out there, that within this Dyson shell solar system that we're in, uh, that, that you, that Jupiter's not there. I'm not saying that in the simulacrum, it's probably there. What I'm saying is, is I don't think anything's ever left our atmosphere. I don't believe that. I've never seen evidence of it. So if I, if, if the television is the only medium by which I received information that something occurred, and yet the television is admitted by all in the world as being one of the greatest acts of deception upon the human race, how can I say that I know anything at all? If 100% of my data comes from a television set, I don't know anything at all. So, no, I, it's a false premise to say something like, like uh, uh, because CERN is doing this, do you think that's the reason why? I don't have any evidence of CERN doing anything. Like I said, I think it's a tax. Your question to me uh, right here, where I can't even find it now, you, me. All right, I don't even see it now. Did you take your question? Did you, did you take it down? Thought it was the next question. You, me. All right, that's gone. I don't see it anymore. No but anyway, uh, the false premise being, I don't remember what you asked me, but that's the type. That, those are the type of questions I get a lot. I am asked to assume something that you're saying is factual in order to answer your question. That's the wrong way to ask me questions. And, and I know this turns a lot of people off, but I cannot begin a truthful answer based off a false premise. I can't do that. This is what science does, 100%. I can't be like them. Wish I could find your question, but I think that was it. I think you took it off. Oh, here it is. Me, you. There it is. What if it were genetic manipulation as what they seem to be doing now? The DNA symbol isn't new. Okay, I don't know that they're doing genetic manipulation. I don't know. I haven't seen any other humans that don't look human. I just don't know. Uh, I know that there are various theories attached to all kinds of things that, that we see on YouTube and talk about. I don't know what those things are actually doing. I didn't get that. So I haven't experienced anything like that. I don't know. So that's, not, that's nothing I could I could uh, deal. Lower class citizen, how you doing? I ain't seen you in a couple days, maybe a week. I don't know about Tavistock Institute. I have heard about the Tavistock Institute, but it's nothing I've researched. What is it? Another shim? Another another CERN type deal? Thank you, Glow Bear. Love you too, man. I'm looking for all caps. Looking for those. Okay. I already answered that question. Red Bull Vodka. Nancy Pelosi, really? I have psychic gifts and I deny them for so long thinking it was honoring God and rejecting sorcery, but I'm not sure what to believe anymore. 
Well, what you consider to be psychic may be just a divorce from your central nervous system's ability to filter out information. A lot of people that have paranormal abilities have them because their central nervous system is damaged to some degree. That because the central nervous system isn't what science tells you it is. It's actually a filtering system. You are jacked in to the simulacrum through the, through the filters of the central nervous system, which filters out how much you see, how much you taste, how much you hear, how much you feel, how much you touch or, or hear. I, I missed one of them. There's five senses. Now, the central nervous system, when it's damaged, that's when you get people that are autistic. Some people can process a, fana a fantastic amount of information, but they can't communicate it. So, uh, yeah, if you see more than most people see, or you feel more than most people do, you're they're one of those. Some of those filters in the central nervous system uh, are not operating optimally because if they were, you would be a totally perfectly normal human. Oh, Jerry Hurley, what's the name of your other channel? Very interested in reading your books. Hey, those would be fiction books, but they have my beliefs about the simulacrum, about what's outside the simulacrum and how all this came to be in, 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 the, in those stories. But I haven't, it's a dead channel. It's just my name, Jason Brashears. I have never put a video on it. I'm asking you guys, is that something you'd be interested to in your leisure time? Would you like to listen to those stories? Because when I was in prison, those manuscripts made the rounds. Even prison guards used to read my stories. Let's see. But if, if people are interested, then I'll just go in. I'll just, every week I'll upload another section and just continue the story. Maybe a Hollywood producer will reach out and want to put it in a movie because it would make a badass three movie series. Let's see. I don't know anything about Saturn being a sun. I would still have to be, for, I would first have to be convinced that uh, Saturn is not just a, a phantasm of the simulacrum. Remember, it is my position that the entire stellar sphere is a multi-tiered holographic template. It's not really there. It's just, it's, it's actually hiding and concealing this vast machinery hidden in the sky. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jahara. Jonathan Harrison, homeboy. I see you, man, at 631. Guys, if you don't know Jonathan Harrison, one of my best friends in the entire world. Doesn't live far from me. Oh, yeah, man. I got to keep him away from my motorcycle. Okay. Uh, 632, T, Jason, any thoughts on Helena Blavatsky? Okay, I'm not with the Golden Dawn Society material at all. However, I used to be, I used to be in communication with Dr. Dr. Barry Warmkessel. Dr. Barry Warmkessel has documented that there is a series of astronomical bodies that visits our world every 3,312 years and every 4,968 years. I contacted Barry Warmkessel and told him, look, I don't know where you're getting your data from, but I applaud you because you are absolutely 100% uh, uh, confirming my Phoenix thesis. Those numbers that, you, that, that, you're, that you're itemizing are Phoenix numbers. They're all divisible. He, he cites three different numbers in, in his scientific research. They're all divisible by 138. And they're all periods that are mentioned in the ancient records. So when he mentioned... Helena Blavatsky, it sent up red flags. And I had to write him a letter. I said, hey, check this out. I sent him the Phoenix chronology. I sent him a full letter of every... Matter of fact, I did a video. Some of y'all seen that video about, about what I sent Dr. Barry Warmkessel. So I sent all in this material. And then I asked him, listen, Hel Helena Blavatsky was not sci a scientist nor an astronomer. I says, according to this 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 uh, bibliographic citation that you provided, you pr you named her as the source for four thousand nine hundred and sixty eight year period. I says, I really need that source because it involves a, a study I've done on that year because I have historical research notes in chronological form, and I can give you the source materials that show that there is a period of four thousand nine hundred sixty eight years that involves cataclysms on Earth. Dr. Barry Warmkessel basically just 
wrote me a polite decline. He didn't want to see the rest of my research. He didn't want to share any of his research. And he wasn't going to give me that citation that he found by Hel Helena Blavatsky. So go figure. But I, if you are familiar with Helena Blavatsky and you know in all her vast works, Isis Unveiled and whatever else she wrote, if any of you know where I can find that, re that reference, it would be invaluable to me. I would do an entire video just, just getting that one reference from, because I have a lot of stuff that would go with it, but I sure could use that one reference. I don't know where to find it, but uh, it's, uh, it's one reference. According to Helena Blavatsky, there is something important about a cycle that's 4,968 years. I need that reference. Let's see. Donovan Jensen, which of your vids show petrified things? I believe I have three different videos that all show images of all these pet, petrified, all these fossil anomalies. You just have to go look at the titles. Look at all the titles, man. And they're going to be within my, two of them are within my first 30 videos. Oh, Tavistock Institute. Okay. I got 51 Project. Thank you, man. I'll get it. Helena Blavatsky. Yeah, man. All right, guys. I'm always led by intuition. I'm at the bottom of the thread. Oh, I just popped another one. Another question just popped up. Jason, can we get predictions for the next six months? Listen, you're going to get them. And not because you asked. Uh, your question is absolutely coincidental. Um, you guys know that for me to do predictions and date sequence prediction and predictive analytics and, and, and isometric projections, they take a lot of time. And because my time, now that I'm full-time archaics, my time is more valuable than ever. So I used to charge $100 when people wanted me to do like predictions for the next two to five years on Australia, or they want me to do them on, on a, a United States or whatever. I can't remember. Uh, I've done them for Thailand. I've done them. I did, well, I have a list now. Uh, I'm going to be doing them for Thailand again. I'm going to be doing them for the UK. I'm going to be doing them for Israel. Uh, uh, a guy just paid me a few days ago. He wants to do them for, for Romania. And the Romanian one is probably going to be very interesting. You got this uh, in memory of Vlad. Just remember I said that. So, uh, yeah, you're going to be getting a lot more predictions videos. Like I'm doing full-time arcades now, so I do have the time. Uh, I'm just... I'm trying to put a structure together, uh, just a lot, a lot going on, not in my personal life, but in my professional life. I have some, I have people that I want to devote attention to, but I don't want to ignore people that aren't popular. You know I mean, I have some people that want to do podcasts. I would like to do podcasts with them and that's fine. I also have some very, some very prestigious individuals that we all know their names and uh, I'm very shocked. I was very shocked. By, by a guy, I'm not going to put him out there, but he's world famous. He puts out a world famous report and he's in the financial markets and he's been doing this for a very long time. His name is a household name. If he appears in the comment section on this video and, and introduces himself, that's okay, but I'm not going to put him out there, but he sent me a package. The man sent me some real Troy ounces of silver and his famous book. Uh, on on the history of silver in the markets, and yeah, you all you all know his name. Been knowing his name for many many years. But uh, I just got his package. I also received this T-shirt from a friend of mine named Jay. See this T-shirt? There it is. Jay gave me this T-shirt. She also sent me another T-shirt. But uh, Chrissy Sakula, uh, your thumb drive's on the way. I got a tracking number on it. Um, let's see. Chrissy just interrupted me. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, yeah, you have predictions videos coming. I'll probably work, start working on them tonight. Tonight. Nancy Pelosi. Why would you go by the name Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> That's crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. So, look. I was shooting for three hours. It's been two hours and 38 minutes. 
But like I said, I'm always led by intuition, guys. Intuition's telling me right now is a good time to stop this video. Might also have something to do with me sweating my ass off. It's hot. Go give me something to drink, rehydrate. Uh, we're going to do another live video real, real quick because right now I don't have time to do the uploads I do that are packed with data. Right now, I'm going to read the rest of the lost scriptures of Giza because the first part's already out there for everybody to check out. I don't want you to have some hang time. I need to go ahead and get that out. So, so what's easy for me to do while I'm doing these readings is to just the day after tomorrow, like tomorrow, I'll read all day. The day after tomorrow, we'll do another live and we'll answer some more questions because one, one, one live video, I'm never going to get to, to everybody's questions. It's just not going to happen. So much love guys. I'm uh, I really appreciate your participation. Thank you for over a thousand people uh, in, in the, in the chat. Hey, smash that like button. I almost have as many likes as, as as many people are in the chat right now. That's amazing. I really, hey, I like your support. Those those are that are financially supported, man. I appreciate it. If you give me about 10, 15 minutes, you will see the links below for anything that you're interested in. Any of the published books that I just showed you, uh, like I said, I don't really push them a lot because I, I don't want to ever come off as a, as a salesman. I just uh, but I know I get so many emails of people asking me for a link to Lost Scriptures or Anunnaki Homeworld or uh, uh, Nostradamus and the Plants of Apocalypse. So I'm just going to provide all the links to all the books in this video below. And please don't order Phoenix or Anunnaki thumb drives. You can order you can order this thumb drive. This is the Super Pack. Over 2,000 pages, images, charts, uh, unpublished research, all of my published books and unpublished books, everything's in here. All of Chronicon, all the Chronicon notes, everything's in here. Uh, you can, I still, I, I, I'm still providing the Super Pack. I am not providing Phoenix Drives and the Nuna Drives. The links are below to Podia. If you want all the Phoenix videos in one download or all the Anunnaki videos in one download, it's easier for me now. Just go to Podia. Go to Podia, one touch of a button, and you download the entire file. All the videos, not in the order YouTube has presented my videos, but in the order that I think you need to watch those videos for the best learning experience. So, anyway, I love you guys. The links will be all down below, and I'm going to go ahead and terminate this video. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you all, you guys, for your support. And, uh... Go check out J Dreamer's video. That was my suggestion. And he mentioned that in the video. J Dreamer's has a video that breaks down truth in movies. He breaks down one of my favorite movies from the 80s, The Night of the Comet. I asked him to do that and he did it and he did a fantastic job. Go check out that. Go check it out. That's J Dreamer's uh, site. Until then, I'm out. But I'm only going to go out once I figure out how to get out. So there's really no, there's really no, no, you just got to exit the, look at, look at me. I'm so YouTube retarded. Wow. Peace out.